All right, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Innovate Retina 2023. Thanks so much for being here. People are still coming in. I'm just going to go through the introductory slides, and we're going to get started with today's program. This is the agenda at a glance. Uh, when you checked in, you should have been able to grab an agenda, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. We've got a lot of great talks and panel discussions planned for us for this afternoon. Today's learning objectives, recognizing how to manage st management strategies that can mitigate the burden of retinal vascular disease, assessing innovations across imaging, medical devices, artificial intelligence, and pharmacotherapeutics, and evaluating novel surgical imaging systems. Uh, activity Providership is jointly sponsored by the Clinical and Patient Educators Association and iVista Medical Education. I want to say a special thanks to the team at iVista, Jaramie, Elena, and their team for their hard work putting this meeting together today. Uh, my program co-directors also want to acknowledge the uh, many hours that went into planning this meeting. Thanks to Prithvi Murthy and Jaya, Diana Do, Kwan Dong Nguyen uh, for their hard work today. And then obviously this isn't a meeting if we don't have world-class speakers in KOLs here to talk to us and lead panel discussions. So thanks to all of our speakers. We have a number of, of wonderful sponsors. One of the highlights of this meeting for physicians is that you don't have to pay to be here and you're gonna get a prime rib dinner. And that's because we've got some really wonderful sponsors. So wanted to take time to thank Genentech, Regeneron, Apelles, Bausch & Lomb, Behringer Ingelheim, Iveric Bio, Resolute, Regenex Bio, Elcon, Ocular Therapeutics, Oculus, and, uh, Oculus, and Termaline. So thanks again to, to all of our sponsors for being such an important part of the innovation ecosystem. There's a program pretest. You can scan this QR code and take that before the meeting. For those of you who are interested in getting CE credit, there's also a post-meeting test and evaluation. That'll be emailed to everyone here who's registered. So again, if you're interested in CE credit, please make sure to fill that out so you can actually get the credit for attending the meeting today. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to my esteemed uh, moderator, Dr. Ted Lang, who's going to be leading our first session on AI di diagnostics. Ted, please take it away. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, on behalf of me and Daniel Ting here, my co-moderator, we'd like to open up this uh, wonderful meeting by talking about AI diagnostics. And we'd like first like to welcome to the stage uh, Professor Ursula schmidt um, to who will be speaking to us about GA progression uh, using artificial intelligence. I will speak without using artificial intelligence, just my normal voice and insight. So thank you very much for the kind consideration. And I was invited to talk about GA progression as measured with GA. These are my disclosures. So I think that there's a consensus out there that best corrected visual acuity is not a reliable marker of GA activity that photoreceptor segmentation and quantification represents a clinically meaningful biomarker, and that photoreceptor degeneration, or rather thinning, was recognized as a clinical trial endpoint in GA by the FDA just recently. At least they said it had a potential. So the objectives now are to find out whether identification and quantification of photoreceptor and RPE integrity and integrity loss can be assessed reliably using deep learning analysis based on SDOCT, and whether there's an impact of those two features in disease activity and particularly in treatment. So we know that GA has a large variability. There may be fast progressors and slow progressors. There may be responders and non-responders. And of course, we need to know this before we get engaged into lifelong invasive therapy. To do this, we have to uncover what is happening in the deep retina at the level of the photoreceptors and the RPE. Please note that photoreceptors are shown in green and that RPE loss, rather, is shown in green. So what we did in our group is that we did an fast semantic segmentation of a three-dimensional volume as a two-dimensional on fast map, reflecting all A scans with complete RPE loss and complete EZ loss. So that means can we move from RPE loss seen on OCT away from fundus autofluorescence because that doesn't 
really give us any insight, and we have shown that this is feasible. And the R is as high as 0.97. That has been shown in Philly and in Oaks and in Derby. Then we did the same thing for photoreceptor thickness mapping. However, you have to understand that the photoreceptor layer is much more sensible, much more fragile. So we really had to spend a lot of time in finding an algorithm that really measures the thickness of the EZ. And note that what we measure is from the top of the EZ to the outer boundary of the third hyperreflective outer retinal band, which is the interdigitation zone. So why is precision so important? Because there is a clear correlation with function. So we used another AI system to do a point-to-point -point correlation between retinal sensitivity at each morphological OCT location and what we found in, in terms of EZ thinning. And we could clearly show that there's a direct correlation between no retinal sensitivity where EZ thickness is zero and full retinal sensitivity with intact photoreceptor thickness, outer photoreceptor layer. And in between, you see the linear correlation that we found and that is so important for our understanding of what we measure and what the clinical relevance is. So fully equipped with this insight, we could then show something that wasn't so organic or wasn't so well known before. I show you here videos over two years of follow-up. You see that the RPE loss just fills in the photoreceptor thinning. This is seen in active lesions. However, there are other lesions like this where I promise I have the video on, but nothing happens because these lesions are just lazy. So we have understood that there's photoreceptor degeneration and RPE degeneration. We look at the two trials, Oaks and Derby, and we look at them separately, photoreceptors and RPE. And what you see under treatment is that clearly the photoreceptor thinning has the steepest curve in the sham arm, obviously, because this is where the disease activity is primarily located, while at the level of the RPE, it's much flatter. And you also see that when you treat monthly or bimonthly, there's a very consistent reduction in that type of layer loss. This is another example of an interesting patient because the fellow eye was not treated, the study eye was treated, and you can clearly see that there is a morphological effect. It doesn't always bear the fovea, but in this case, it did. So it's possible. How about the range of lesions that were included when we talk about this, photo, this RPE photoreceptor ratio? You see, there's a wide variability. And that is very important because disease activity depends on this baseline RPE loss versus photoreceptor ratio. And you can clearly see here when we distribute this evenly between the four quartiles, in the lowest quartile where there's hardly any photoreceptor loss outside of the RPE loss, there is the lowest progression, while in the quartile number four, there is the highest. And this is the same if you look on the therapeutic response, just distributed in the same quartiles. You see quartile one, the lowest difference, hardly anything is responding to therapy. Over quartile two, three, this response improves. And in quartile four, it's clearly the highest. So yes, there is a difference. How can we see this difference in clinical practice? Of course, we need to use standard OCT, and we need to use an AI tool that is reliable, that is real-time by the cloud, works on standard OCT, offers an on-fast localization of RPE damage and photoreceptor damage, shows us the ratio at baseline so that we have an idea whether this patient will benefit. And this is available. There's one example, this is a spin-off of my university, of course I'm proud of this, and you see that at month two, 
this ratio is already decreasing at, at month 12, probably the end of the growth has already been achieved. So at that point, you wouldn't treat that patient anymore. And this offers all the information that you need at one glance. It's based on a regular spectralis OCT. It has MDR approval in Europe, and it can be used for investigational purposes in the US, obviously. So by conclusion, OCT-based AI analysis reliably identifies photoreceptor change and RPE loss. We know that photoreceptor change is driving the progress. We know that this ratio that we can see very reliable on the OCT images using AI has an important meaning, and we are now waiting for clinical AI-based tools that are becoming available because, of course, the best is yet to come, as always in science. Thank you for your interest. Thanks, Ursula. Thanks, Ursula. Yeah. Um, next up, we have uh, Dr. Jennifer Lim, who's going to talk to us about uh, AI for DR screening. Jenny, stage Thank you, yours. Dan and Ted. These are my financial disclosures, the relevant one of which is INUC. I believe that AI will assist us in screening for the growing prevalence of diabetic retinopathy related to the growing prevalence of diabetes in the world today. In fact, globally, it's felt that about 35% of all diabetics have diabetic retinopathy and 10% have vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy. We all know that the risk of blindness increases with the severity of the disease, and therefore it's incumbent upon us to detect diabetic retinopathy at the earliest stages possible. Yet, when we look at the IDFR and all the data, we see that of the 415 million diabetics today, upwards of 50% do not comply with the diabetic screening recommendations. And the diabetic screening burden is only going to increase with the projected increase in prevalence of diabetes to 642 million by 2040. One solution would be to screen these patients at the point of care visits. We know that 88% of diabetics visit their primary care provider at least one time per year. And if we screen them at that visit, we can mitigate socioeconomic disparities, transportation issues, referral and follow through, and specialist availability. Now, the ideal screening tool would be one with high sensitivity compared with specificity, such that the negative predictive value is close to 100%, so that we won't miss vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy, although we may have to screen a few unnecessarily. Now, there are two AI FDA-approved systems in the US. There's the IDXDR, approved in 2018, and the IART, approved in 2020. Both of these use 45-degree digital fundus photos, which are read by the cloud. Both have high sensitivity, specificity, and accuracy, and studies that are multi-centered in comparison to a reading center. The IDXDR multi-center pivotal trial was done in 10 primary care sites. In this study of 900 plus patients, the detection of patients with more than mild diabetic retinopathy was achieved with a specificity of 91%, sensitivity of 87%, and 96% imageability. In an improved AI algorithm, which graded no DR, more than mild DR, and vision-threatening diabetic retinopathy, the sensitivity was 100% for referable DR and vision-threatening DR. Thus, the negative predictive value was 100%. The multicenter IR pivotal trial was done in 15 sites, which included primary care, endocrinology, ophthalmology, and retina. And this system used a variety of non-midriatic cameras. In this study, again, high sensitivity of 96% and specificity of close to 88% was achieved. In the study, we performed a subgroup analysis where we performed the, uh, we compared the performance of ophthalmologists to the AI system. And you can see as ophthalmologists, we didn't do as well in terms of sensitivity. Overall, we were at 28% compared to 96% for the AI system. When we break down the ophthalmologist to retina specialists, we see that retina specialists perform better at 59.5% compared to 20.7% for non-retina specialists. So you might wonder, well, how effective are these AI screening programs? I've shown you the sensitivity, specificity, and the negative predictive value. But ultimately, the impact on vision will depend upon whether the patients actually access and adhere to the recommended referrals, the treatment and management recommendations. And of course, there are going to be care frictions and imperfections available for these patients. So there was a study done by Dr. Chenna 
and it was called the Caravel AI Outcomes. And in this study, they estimated what is the risk of vision loss at five years if you use a regular eye care provider. They estimated that at 1,625 per 100,000. Now, if you add AI to that, you can have a risk of 1,535 per 100,000. Thus, the difference is you save 90 more patients. If you multiply that by the number of diabetics in the US, this will result in 33,000 fewer patients with visual loss in the United States alone. Now at Johns Hopkins, they implemented the IDXDR, and in their pediatric endocrinology clinic, they reported that between 2018 and 2020, once they implemented this AI screening, the risk, the uh, number of patients screened increased from 49% to 95%. Also at Hopkins, in the community physicians' clinical sites in 2020, they reported that they were able to close the equity gap but the with the implication that AI helped them do this. At UIC, we are looking at the effectivity in our family clinical practice, but we don't have our data just yet. Cost effectiveness with Markov modeling has also shown that AI screening ICER is 180 versus an ophthalmologist ICER 215. So it appears to be financially feasible. It's very important to realize, however, that with any AI system, it reflects the bias of the database. And therefore, the utility of any AI system will depend upon the use of diverse and robust input data, which needs to be multi-ethnic, Mostly demographic, using a variety of imaging equipment for image acquisition. So in conclusion, AI for DR screening can address the screening burden efficiently at point of care, it can address disparities of care, and it's less costly than telemedicine or physicians. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so, thank you so much, Jenny. Uh, next up will be Yannick Liederman, who will be speaking about AI during vitreoretinal surgery. Yannick. Thank you, Ted. Well, these are my disclosures uh, of note. I am a co-founder of MGS, which holds intellectual property for some of the technology that I'll be discussing with you today. I'd like to start out with an overview of surgical guidance as, as we define it in terms of the application of AI. There are three critical components. One is the integration of data from our imaging modalities, our instrumentation, as well as the behavior of the surgeon, which is something we're, we're not doing yet. Next, there's data analysis. In our case, we use a combination of a deep learning neural network and computer vision. And finally, the output has to be in real time, meaning sufficient for either the surgeon or the instrumentation to modify their behavior, uh, ideally to enhance instrument performance and support decision making. So here's our pipeline. Uh, all of our work uses commercially available microscopes, either stereo digital microscopy or microscopes with uh, high definition video cameras. Uh, most of the engineering I'll be talking to you about involves either the classification and segmentation of surgical instruments as well as relevant anatomical landmarks, uh, and then we provide an overlay to the surgical scene. So three categories I'd like to briefly review today, enhanced visualization, surgical templates, and tissue and tool tracking. So here's an example of enhanced visualization and membrane peeling. You can see in the scene on the left, uh, the haze is from anterior media, and that compromises the view to some degree. Uh, using AI enhanced visualization, you can see here, for example, there's a subtle retinal vessel proximal to the forceps tips that's much more difficult to make out in the scene to the left. Um, and in, in terms of some of the surgeons that have looked at these videos, we have um, positive feedback in terms of the utility of this potentially in the OR. Here's an example of surgical templates. Uh, these are target templates for three and four millimeters for inserting the trocars. Uh, all of you who are vitreo retinal surgeons are aware that we can probably increase efficiency to some degree. Uh, you can see also that uh, the actual distance that the cannula is inserted is uh, shown in real time here. So here's a spot of heme or in an example like this. Uh, it's really quite useful when there's a lot of subconjunctival hemorrhage or, or erythema in terms of using a, a template like this. So here's an example of tool and tissue tracking. Uh, the AI network is showing the location of the vitrectomy probe, the macula, the optic nerve head in real time. There's probably not a lot of utility in displaying this to, to the surgeon, but we really show this just as a proof of principle in terms of the speed at which the network works. 
Here's a more complex scene where we're tracking and segmenting a retinal break, the individual laser spots, the aiming beam, uh, the laser tip, the macula, as well as the optic nerve. And as you can see, this is all under air. Interestingly, the network performance really isn't compromised in the same way that, that our own visualization is under air. Here's an example of collision avoidance methodology. So the network identifies the shallow retinal detachment and the depression mound, and you can see we can set a threshold and activate a, a distance warning. And this may be useful for a trainee, but the real value here, as I see it, is if we can provide feedback to our instrumentation more rapidly than the surgeon can react uh, and automatically decrease the vacuum or turn off the cutter, there's the potential to decrease, for example, iatrogenic breaks. So really the, the heart of this in the first part of the talk was engineering and it's really how um, efficiently and robustly we can detect anatomical landmarks as well as surgical instrumentation. Um, the AUPR values you can see for the most part for segmentation uh, are really quite robust. We have um, a couple areas that are, are still challenging. But uh, this will then allow us to do, in addition to engineering and creating surgical guidance, uh, I think some other interesting uh, academic work. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about some, some work that we're just about to submit for publication, and that's performance evaluation. So using deep learning, we've identified a number of metrics that differentiate trainees in vitreal retinal surgery, fellows, uh, from um, more experienced attendings. Some of the things are intuitive to us as humans, for example, um, surgical phase length, how long it takes one to, to peel a membrane. Some of them, uh, I think, are intuitive but would be very tedious to monitor, such as idle time, uh, the, the absolute amount of time where either an instrument isn't doing anything or, or is not in the eye, and others like velocity and acceleration uh, really are not intuitive. So in the interest of time, you know, we can't go through any of this, but you can see, for example, um, looking at surgical phase length, the top graph here on the left, uh, you can see, for example, um, the red core vitrectomy, uh, when you progress from fellow to attending level, you tend to do this more quickly. Um, but interestingly here, for example, velocity, you can see in uh, endolaser is something that even at the attending level, within the first five years of practice, uh, we perform differently. And this is something, again, that was independently identified by the network. We've extended some of this work to using a simulator as well. This is the IC simulator with which most of you are probably uh, familiar. Uh, this is an educational version. Uh, please don't tell my chair that we hacked into it, but uh, we used a number of modules such as vitrector training, uh, posterior hyloid removal, ILM peeling, and one of the things that we've integrated in the simulator as proof of principle that we want to take to the OR is simultaneously tracking retinal gaze. So an example here, a trainee is lasering uh, a tear and the green comet tail is where the surgeon is actually looking. Uh, interestingly, attendings, and this is something I wouldn't have guessed, we tend to look more so uh, at the retinal break, whereas trainees tend to look at, at the laser spot. Whether that's significant, we don't know, but I think there's a lot of potential in understanding visual attention by using gaze as a surrogate combined with instrument maneuvers. So in summary, we've developed an automated pipeline capable of tracking the location of surgical instruments and relative, relevant anatomic features during vitreoretinal surgery in real time using deep learning and computer vision. We've achieved effective instrument localization using regional-based convolutional neural networks, computed the distance between the instrument and the retina uh, from two-dimensional images, implemented a framework for surgical guidance, and we've been able to do most of this in real time. Uh, so this is a number of trainees as well as uh, masters and graduate students that have come through the lab over, I would say, the last uh, five to six years now. Uh, I'd particularly like to mention Rogerio Nespolo. He's uh, a current PhD student in the lab, about to graduate, who's, who's really done uh, a lot of the outstanding engineering in the last couple of years. Thank you. Wonderful talks to kick off this meeting. Uh, these pap papers are now open for discussion, so if anyone has a, a question to ask, please line up behind one of these microphones. But as we begin the panel discussion, uh, I would like to introduce our panelist here, Dr. Uh, Yasser Sipa, who is an imaging expert uh, at Stanford. And um, maybe I'll, I'll kick off the, uh, the questions here before uh, <laughs> uh, you have a chance to, to ask yours uh, to Yasser. Um, you know, in... Um, we saw in uh, Ursula's talk that the photoreceptor map loss was observed. Um, do you know of any work that's been done to correlate that with any sort of additional imaging like adaptive optics or histology, which uh, could correlate the results she's seeing? Yes, here? Yeah, Question for yeah, for you. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if um, 
Anyone, I, I know that Hendrik Scholl and his group has, has, have been looking at four receptors and adaptive optics. Um, we do at Alf Tubrens and, and, and his lab has shown some uh, correlation um, with the EZ loss and then confirmation of whether the photoreceptor exists or not. But I would like to take this a slightly different way. I think the, the way we need to look at this is whether we can connect the functional endpoints, whether that's BCVA or some sort of retinal sensitivity to photoreceptor loss, because I think in clinical trial setting and in clinical practice, that would probably be a more important correlation to make. Um, as far as whether the photoreceptor exists or not, I think Ursula and her team has shown that it, it probably is not there if the EZ is not there. Ursula, any, 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 any points to add? I think that we, we were all very surprised when we looked at the images that we obtained because we were completely unbiased, no stairs, no, no, no stocks, no shares, nothing. And we are just imaging maniacs. So we looked at this and we discovered this pattern of disease activity so dependent on whether there is a large zone of photoreceptor thinning, we should not say loss, it, we now understand it's thinning, around the clinical lesion because the RPE loss is the clinical lesion, that's all we see. And it amazed us when we compared these OCT images with the two layers to what the FAF image showed. We had no idea as clinicians how advanced the disease is and how large the differences are. And we have seen this pattern in just an obs observational st studies and we have seen it in multiple different therapeutic studies now that are completely different than complement inhibition. So I think that it is an important insight and we have to see how we can use it to learn further. Yeah, thanks, Ursula. So questions from Flo? Yeah. yeah. Um, all great talks. I thought they were fantastic. Ursula, I was curious to know what your thoughts are. In your, in your photoreceptor loss graphs, the pixetocopelin treated patients are actually, the slopes change. It's almost flat for like three to six months with no loss, and then there's like a linear loss that takes off. Why the difference? Why, why is it almost no loss initially during those first few months, it seems like, and then you, you get more of a linear, but much better than non-treated patients? Yeah, of course, this is just descriptive. This is what we have seen and measured. It's a different cup of coffee to now find an explanation for it. I don't know. I just see that this is the same also in the Gale study. As soon as the sham lesions become treated, we see the same type of stop of further photoreceptor thinning. So this seems to be therapeut therapeutically induced. And it does have a functional correlate because when you correlate it with microperimetry, which actually wasn't really made in a targeted way that would allow to really use it to follow what changes in the junctional zone. This is just static perimetry. It is not changed according to the lesion size. And the photoreceptor thinning goes far out. So in most cases, it's far beyond the Maya spots that were placed. So I think that there's also more room for learning. We'll see. Thanks, Ursula. So Jenny, um, questions uh, to you. Um, so uh, related to AI bias, right? So you mentioned about the importance of uh, taking uh, into account the multi any populations when you actually do the AI studies. So how, how do you guys uh, include this into the study design when you guys run the, uh, um, the trial? So, uh, that's a great question, Dan. And specifically, we chose inner city sites so that we would get diverse populations, have African American populations included into the study um, as well in the United States. And that's really important because, as you can, as you know, if the AI system is not trained on that, it may not be able to detect the difference because of the pigmentation differences. Yep. And there have been studies like looking at the IDXDR in younger patients where you have the opposite, right? The ILM is highly reflective. And so there are a greater number of false uh, positives in that study. But you can adjust the algorithm once you train it in that way. Right. Question from the floor. 
I mean, yeah. <clears throat> I have a question on the same uh, subject. So in the old time, let's say, when we do a classification in the disease, usually the um, diversity, ethnicity is not taken into account. So we say macular holes, this is the classification. Diabetic retinopathy, this is the classification. Now for AI, we take care of having representative population. So who is right? Are really human different? Or is it because it's a technical, technical issues, as you explained, for some modalities like uh, photos, in which there may be differences. So I think your question was, are there real differences between the, the stages that we were describing for? There are. So there is definitely you know, mild, moderate, severe, definitely. But I think you have to train them for different layer, levels of pigmentation. And I think, you know, Dan, you have multi-centers there in Singapore where you've deployed Selena for actual screening. And, and they've done a beautiful job there in Singapore with very high area under the curves and showing that it's very relevant. But I think it, it really speaks to the importance of the importance of diversity and in informing the databases because otherwise you can then do implicit bias as well into these systems, which will then propagate the disparities of healthcare. Thank you. Thank you. Yannick, um, regarding your work, do you think that uh, you know we have these core competencies and other training models we use for our residents and fellows? Do you think? some of these tools, some of these metrics will eventually percolate them, themselves into the, those competencies? I would certainly hope so. I think um, some of the, our colleagues in larger surgical subspecialties have started to look uh, particularly at, at the role of, um, you know, perhaps implicit bias in, in evaluation of surgical trainees. Uh, and I think we're, we're all aware that we have really rigorous metrics in terms of the cognitive performance, knowledge-based areas of assessing trainees. Uh, there, there was just a significant paper in uh, the archives of surgery that relayed that surgical trainees who are um, who are women or people of color uh, tend to be evaluated um, much uh, lower uh, and also self-evaluate interestingly lower than than their peers, perhaps from from feedback. And uh, you know, I was sharing this with a, an AI colleague, and they said, "Boy, I hope that's not the case in ophthalmology." But I think the assumption has to be that it probably is. So I think developing even structural subjective assessment-based tools, uh, of which there are some in ophthalmology, they're just still relatively labor-intensive and, and cumbersome, uh, is a first step. I think being able to automate some of those assessments, and you know, clearly that, that's an academic interest of mine, will probably help us to, at, at least if not eliminate implicit bias, get closer to where we are in terms of knowledge-based assessments and at least have some, some objective measures rather than the, the sort of truly subjective way that we evaluate most of our learners now in surgery. Thank you. Um, yes, here, um, you know, given your knowledge of the, the way the OCT and other imaging devices work, do you, is there inherent variability from device to device or test to test that you think will impact the ability of the uh, AI models to be trained accurately? Yeah, I think uh, just like Jennifer showed that, you know, all the AI um, for diabetic retinopathy screening, the ones who have been uh, certified or approved right now, they've been trained on the 45 degree field of view, right? And there is, so if you take it and uh, extrapolate it to OCTs, the algorithms for acquisition may be different, the reflectivity of different layers may be different, and then if you take it to OCTA or fundus order fluorescence, of course, there are a lot of variables that you will have to take into account um, in, we have just recently shown that the choreo capillaris, which is becoming a hot topic, and the flow voids, when you measure it um, through a, um, a CNN uh, using Plex Elite versus uh, up to view, same eye, same day, significant, statistically significant difference that you see in the size, the number, the area. So I think, yes, they, that we will have to take into account the variability um, at the device level, both acquisition and, um, um, and processing. Yeah, so I'm gonna ask the last questions. Um, Ted gave me an honor to do that. So uh, questions to the, the panel, right? I mean, um, what do you, um, how, how do you guys uh, see the importance of explainability like uh, in the you know, AI system that you guys are, are doing? Uh, I'm gonna open to the panel, um, yeah. Jenny? In terms of the explainability maps, yeah. well, 
you know, ours was not a black box, so we didn't do that. That's more for the deep learning, but you're absolutely right. I think it can inform us of things that maybe we don't know. So like, for example, when we were doing like our, our sickle cell work, which I didn't talk about today, um, you can look at exactly what is the system looking at, like around the FAZ, and, and does it make sense? And it actually does, right? Because that's where the ischemia, the dropout is that would inform the stages of sickle cell retinopathy because you get dropout there in the posterior pole, which correlates with the non-perfusion in the periphery as well. And I think uh, we learn a lot by, by looking at the explainability maps. Thanks, Jenny. Sula, any uh, points to add about explainability? I think that that is very important, of course, and consistency of the data, but a, there are enough AI methods that allow to really search for the feature type and location that the AI system has discovered to make a specific conclusion. I would strongly suggest that we use AI to describe and measure and not to explain, because that is probably too early. But of course, also in human assessment, as we just heard, the variability is so huge. And Jennifer, I just wanted to ask you, when do you think that in clinical trials, the subjective human expert-based DRSS score assessment will be exchanged versus some of those digital systems because counting microaneurysms, looking on venous beading, I mean, that is really the top of subjectivity. That's a great point, Ursula. And as you know very well, all of these AI systems correlate very well with, ma with reader, you know, mass graders. The correlation is very high, so we can actually replace them now. Uh, right, you can replace so why is it, it so much happening? faster. Why is it not <laughs> happening? Well, uh, I think times, uh, there is a resistance, right, to change. It's disruptive technology. There are reading centers out there, and I think we have to still correlate some of these works to make absolutely sure that they're on target. Like you said, but I think it, it can happen. It just, uh, we have to deploy the AI systems to measure the, you know, to quantitate these areas and uh, find other things for these reading centers then to maybe verify, say, maybe 10% of the data, right? So the AI system does it, then the graders go back just to double check, just like they do for each other. Uh, I think it's just one of those things that takes time to evolve with disruptive technology. Yeah, and it doesn't always increase the quality when you say that you do manual adjustment, because in right. this photoreceptor thinning, as soon as you read in the papers that manual correction has been done, exactly. that's a warning sign, and the manual correction introduces the subjectivity that we did not want. Exactly. Thank you so much to everyone. We're in the uh, interest of time. We're going to move this on so that we can keep this going. Sure. Uh, this is. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, thank Ted, and then for leading the session. Certainly, uh, this is not a question, but rather an announcement. Uh, you can see the work on AI has been a, a tremendous. There, and the number of publications in AI and Dr. Marsh had uh, increased tremendously there. So with that, uh, we have decided, we and our colleague from University of Michigan had decided to launch the first journal in optomic AI that will be uh, coming out very shortly with that. And so for this journal, we devote exclusively to the work of AI and big data in ophthalmology. And we have the backing of Elsevier, the major publisher from American Journal of Ophthalmology and Progress and Retina and Eye Research, among others. So hopefully, many of you who do your work uh, right now on AI and big data, hopefully now you will have a forum to include that. So that's the information session. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, that was a great start to innovate retina. I'm Diana Doe. I'm joined by my good friend and expert, Eleonora Ladd from Duke. And our next session will be equally exciting. We're talking about complement inhibition. Is it overrated? Our first speaker will be none other than Dr. Sunil Srivastava from the Cole Eye Institute, and he'll be talking about an important topic, inflammation. Uh, thank you, it's, uh, lovely to be here, and everyone loves a uveitis talk. Here's my financial disclosures. Please note, uh, uh, who, who am I consultant for, who I receive research grants from, my licensee royalties, and I've served on multiple DSMCs, and not including any of the things uh, I'm gonna talk about today. So inflammation, aka UVI, is not something just for the cool nerds of ophthalmology, like myself and Quan. Sometimes this strikes the fear in ophthalmologists, and when it's expected, it's not a big deal. Post-surgery, post-infection, when it's unexpected, obviously confusing, scary, and troubling. Um, what am I missing, and can someone lose vision permanently, is what I ask any time I see a patient who has uveitis. In the last few years, in retina, we've experienced this. Unexpected inflammation when things come to us, whether it's in clinical trials or post-clinical trials, 
just listing a few. And we've heard a little bit about complement inhibitors. Could these be next? So let me give you first a step backwards. Let's learn from the past. Let's, when we review some of these past therapies that have had issues, one of the things that I think there have been a couple lessons from this, that inflammation for some was present on imaging in the trial, but may not have been recognized, and retreatment or reinstitution of therapy occurred. Inflammation and retinal artery occlusions can occur even later on into therapy, 12 to 18 months, in the periphery, not necessarily centrally, and missed. Severe vision loss is possible once inflammation occurs, and this mandates that you have to stop therapy and begin anti aggressive anti-inflammatory therapy. And careful clinical exam is required once the patient starts any therapy and any new symptoms of oh, suspicious inf inflammation warrants evaluation. The other lesson is we're pretty bad at assessing inflammation. I'm not you know, damning all of us, but we suck. I mean, we have bad equipment. The salt lamp in our retina office might not be on its last legs. We do fast exams, and the imaging is not carefully reviewed by clinicians. And they say, well, we have reading centers, but think about reading centers. Reading centers mainly focus on one thing, OCT fundus photo FA. They don't necessarily review them all together sequentially. They don't look for subtle signs of inflammation, and it's not necessarily always clinicians looking at images. They're masked and unable to use clinical inflammation. And I'll show you an example of a fundus photo from baseline and the study visit. They look pretty good. The nerves look pretty good. When you look at the fluorescein, you'll say, well, maybe the fluorescein at the study visit is a little, the nerves a little hot. But when you look at it in comparison to the other eye, and then you go back and look at the baseline, you kind of get an understanding that this nerve has been now become pretty inflamed but unrecognized for several, several months because no one's looking at this time and doesn't have necessarily clinical disc edema. So subtle low rates of inflammation and controlled clinical trials, not what will happen in the real world. It will never happen in the real world because we have lots more patients. These patients are primed for inflammation. They have systemic inflammatory disease. They're post-surgery. They're previously treated. They're sicker. They're on medications that promote inflammatory response. Some of these patients have been tre treated with humanized antibodies, which increase the risk of anti-drug antibodies. They've been previously treated with intravitreal therapy, which changes the blood retinal barrier. Inflammations may be also related to manufacturing, which actually could improve over time and mean lower rates. And inflammation complications can always occur months later. We would love to think it's one and done, but it's not. So for the complement inhibitors, these are both theoretically low inflammatory, theoretically, because they're not antibodies. They're a peptide or RNA aptamer, which theoretically has, should have low immunogenicity. But they all have PEG, and PEG has been associated with antibodies that many of us express and are at high levels, even in normals, and really high levels in some specific patients. If you look at, sorry, if you look at just the rates, for some reason, it doesn't want to show the Oaks and Derby. I don't know why that is, but I'm just going to tell you <laughs> that it was got a hold of your slide. There is nobody <laughs> taking over these slides. And I'll tell you also that in uh, Gather 1 and Gather 2, also relatively low. And the ones that were in Dokes and Irby should be said, the first few were related to a manufacturing issue. And OK, now we're done. Thanks a lot. <laughs> and inflammation doesn't occur, and we're good. So, uh, uh, so in 2023, just at ASRS, the rest committee reported 21 cases of uveitis in patients treated with pexidocopalin, 17 pan-uveitis cases. And 11 eyes of nine patients had retinal vasculitis, eight which were occlusive. And at that point in time, there were estimated 65,000 vials that had been delivered. When you look at some of these, these are pretty significant. And again, running right through, I'm just going to tell you it's amazing. OK. So <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I'll just say that those cases showed pretty significant systemic vasculitis. Uh, I'm sorry, retinal vasculitis. And, and the one I wanted to show you, though, which went through very, very quickly, the hemorrhagic vasculitis was actually peripheral first, something that could be missed very, very easily. So why? No one knows why. There are many theories abound, but the reality is none of us are going to be able to explain this to you. Everyone wants to say it's this one thing or this one thing. It can't be. Inflammation is too complicated. It can't be just one thing. Clearly, there is a multitude of risk factors that can happen in these patients. So is this going to happen with ACP, and is it going to happen to Iveric's drug? Probably. 
It's just a matter of time. Because some cases of inflammation are going to occur with unknown severity, with both drugs, we're hard to know if there were subtle cases in the clinical trials. We haven't had the opportunity to, for us in the retina community to look at all the images, look at all the photos, and put them all together. Sometimes it's hard to miss. So the ultimate question, will this limit your use of complement inhibition of AMD? And it comes down to a very simple thing. Are you a believer? When you look at those graphs, is that enough for you? Because the risk benefit is the clear thing here. The one thing I'll end with here is remember, the clinical trial was in, in patients who had non-neovascular AMD. And we should use it in non-neovascular AMD. We don't know the results or the outcomes in patients who have macular atrophy from neovascular AMD and are treated. We have to be very clear. We know the outcomes in one particular set. Let's not generalize it yet to others because we don't know if the risk benefit makes sense. The final take home points, if you do have this patient, because we don't get much advice, treat these aggressively. Assume it could be either infectious or inflammatory, treat for both. Go for it. Get a lot of images. Call UVI to specialists that you're friendly with and ask what to do. There are lots of things we can do to hopefully mitigate and minimize the uh, damage. And in summary, inflammation is a known complication. The exact nation is not uh, completely understood. We can easily miss it. Manage acute inflammation with an aggressive approach and always be vigilant and persistent. Thank you. Thank you, so excellent and insightful. And it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dante Pieramici, who will talk on real world experience with complement inhibition. What Sunil didn't disclose was that these new, these new medicines, these biologics, these complement inhibitors, and these gene therapies are gonna keep him in business and his uveitis cool, uveitis power. <laughs> so that's a disclosure he didn't do. I'm gonna talk a little bit about real world data, get us out of the AI. I've been involved in a number of clinical trials for complement inhibitors and an advisor and companies. We have two drugs, Pixidocopalin and Evet's syncaptid pegol ACP that are now out in the wild. I'm going to primarily focus on pixidocopalin because we have more information on that. We all know the results of the trial. The results of the trial, an anatomical outcome, an anatomical benefit that was seen, and this benefit seems to increase over time. But now that we're in the real world, how are we going to assess this outcome in real world databases? It's going to be difficult. We, we, we gleaned a lot of information on, on of efficacy and effectiveness of the drugs in the real world with neovascular AMD. Remember how we saw that we were losing visual acuity in patients over time, and this caused us to change our strategies and develop new technologies for neovascular AMD. But how are we going to get this efficacy outcome? Well, Ursula showed us how we might get this efficacy outcomes in these large databases. It's use of deep learning and AI algorithms. We're going to have to standardize our imaging with OCTs, but I think we're going to be able to you know, interrogate our databases, these large databases. What we can do now is pharmacovigilance. We can look at these large databases to detect, assess, and understand and prevent adverse events. And we've already seen one of these adverse events that wasn't seen in the clinical trials. Now with both of these complement inhibitors, in my, from my understanding, and this is vasculitis and occlusive vasculitis. The question that the big databases may answer for us is how common is this really in the real world? Well, we're going to get this sort of information. Well, one, one source of information is the FDA. The FDA doesn't give up on a drug after the phase three clinical trial, but there's post-marketing surveillance and there's a FEARS database, but there's other post-marketing data sources as well, the drug manufacturers, scientific literature, observational studies like the Garland trial for Apellis, and we have some great databases that we can use, the IRIS database, the Vestrum database, and the ASRS REST registry safety databases. These have all been used very effectively with neovascular AMD and now being used for geographic atrophy. This is how the FDA data can get to the FDA. You can report it yourself as a physician or a patient, but probably more effectively is to report it to the manufacturer if you have a problem, and then they are obligated to report it to the FDA. And this is how about 95% of the reports get in there. I think Apellis, in my opinion, has been pretty transparent with how they've gone about this. They've not only reported to the FDA, but they've actually gone above and beyond the call to try to investigate this in further detail. If a case is reported to them, they will adjudicate this. They will get the 
the clinical images. They will get more details on the case, and they have a adjudication team internally, and they will send this out then to an external review board, which you see listed here on the top, as well as an external reading center. And from this, try to determine whether or not there is a confirmed case of vasculitis. As of October 4th, this is they had 10, um, at least Apellis identified 10 vasculitis cases. Uh, some of these were occlusive and some were non-occlusive. They were all following the first injection of Sifovri. They tended to occur somewhere between 8 to 18 days following the injection. And as you can see, some of the patients had returned to baseline. There were some partial recoveries. But there were a number of patients with very serious and poor outcomes, including no light perception vision. I think since this time, there's been a couple more cases presented. Why didn't we see these cases in the clinical trials? Well, there was only about 1,300 patients that got injected in the clinical trials. And it's important, this is a per patient thing. In the real world, there's been under over 100,000 vials distributed. How much of these have been used? We don't really know. But Apellis tells us it's a rate of about 0.01% per injection. Um, in the Threat Consultants of America, we've looked at our database. This uh, organization includes 265 retina specialists, almost 2 million annual patients' visits, and a, almost a million intravitreal injections. Of course, most of these are anti-VEGF injections. About 90% of our doctors are on MDI, so we can collate all this information to a central database and interrogate it then for studies. This is our pexidocopaline use over the first months. You can see there was a rapid rise in the use, and it sort of tapered off or, or stabilized as these case reports got presented. Uh, there really hasn't been a reduction. This is September's only half of a month, so I think it's been pretty stable. From our database, there were 3,842 individual patients that got a pexidocopaline intravitreal injection out of 10,000 total injections. There was one case of an occlusive vasculitis that's been confirmed with fluorescein angiography, relatively poor outcome. So the incidence rates per patient was 0.03% first time injection. You know, we're currently using our database and have partnered now with Retina AI so that we hope that we can not only get pharmacovigilant data from this, but we'll be able to use our OCTs and look at uh, anatomical outcomes so we'll get a better sense of what is the real world efficacy or effectiveness. Um, and I think this is important. It made a big difference in how we manage our neovascular AMD patients. And, when, and particularly when there's a small benefit, you really want to know whether or not we're getting that benefit in the real world, because there is risk, as we've seen. Thank you very much. It's been my pleasure. It's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Peter Kaiser, who will talk about emerging therapies in complement inhibition. So thank God you didn't ask me to talk about safety or efficacy. <laughs> I just get to talk about what's coming next. Here are my financial disclosures. So why compliment? Why are we even talking about this? Well, first of all, we learned early on GWAS studies that complement was involved. That was one of the main reasons why we decided to target this pathway. Histopathology also shows many areas within the complement cascade which are involved in macular degeneration. So it makes sense. So what are some of the emerging areas we're looking at? Well, the first area is C1Q. And just looking at it, you say, well, C1Q, normally the classical pathway is activated by an antibody. We don't know of an antibody that causes macular degeneration, but some of the other things that activate C1Q are beta amyloid, C-reactive protein, amyloid beta is in drusen, so it makes sense. C1Q is also a driver of neurodegeneration, so an anti-C1Q then would also be neuroprotective. There was a phase two clinical study called the Archer study, which showed that the primary wasn't met, but more importantly, unlike some of our other drugs, we have a 15-letter difference in terms of the treated patients versus the sham patients in phase two. So this is an approvable endpoint. Uh, it's based on neuroprotection, and this drug is moving forward into phase three. So it's exciting that we can actually maybe get some vision improvement using a complement inhibitor. The main component of the complement system, the most active, is the alternative pathway. It's constantly being activated because our body is trying to get rid of foreign pathogens, and we don't know what we don't know. 
And one of the key regulators of this is factor B, as well as factor T. So Roche has a anti-sense uh, targeting factor B. So what this does is you deliver this, and it breaks down the factor B in your body. Uh, this is a systemically administered drug, and it's currently in phase two testing. Now we know about factor D, there was a huge study that unfortunately failed with the lampalizumab drug, but there are other companies looking into this, and the reason they're still looking into this is when you really kind of dive deep into the lampalizumab studies, maybe not enough was actually getting to the targets that is required. So Alexion currently has a phase two study with a oral complement factor D inhibitor, and so we'll see if using an oral factor D inhibitor will work. We know how the alternative pathway is turned off. It's turned off by complement factor H and complement factor I. The problem is that if you were to just inject complement factor H or complement factor I, the non-mutated wild type, it's gonna be destroyed very rapidly. So really the only way to target this is with gene therapy. Uh, there are several companies looking at this. Gyroscope uh, Novartis has, has to come out of this technology, but other companies are looking at the idea of replacing complement factor H. So if you think about this, unlike our complement inhibitors, we're trying to block this system. Using a factor H is the opposite. We're modulating the problem. We're improving the system. So maybe, just maybe, that will reduce the side effects. We don't know. The first drug to be FDA approved was blocking C3. So, you know, pharma companies are sheep. And see how many companies are now following along with their own C3 inhibitors. There are many drugs in this space, so we'll see how they go. There's also C3B direct inhibitors. A lot of this is coming from the oncology, and I'm not oncology, the, the systemic uh, space, PNH, for instance, that are being brought now to ophthalmology. The second drug that was approved was C5. So again, other companies are targeting C5. We'll see if those work. And the final area, and the most damage that occurs is when we have the membrane attack complex form. And so one of the ways to really almost pinpoint target the damage that we're seeing that causes geographic atrophy is to prevent formation of the membrane attack complex. And you can do that with soluble CD59. We know that CD59 is found in Drusen. It's found around geographic atrophy. So the idea of targeting CD59 is very interesting. A company called Hamera, which is now at J&J, &J, has a gene therapy to deliver soluble CD59 over time. So we have a lot of very exciting drugs in a complement space. They gave me only five minutes. Thank you. It was eight when I first signed up for this. <laughs> but thankfully, uh, we have many exciting drugs that hopefully one of them will hit in the future. Thank you. for the outstanding synopsis. Our next expert speaker is Dr. Judy Kim, safety reporting for ocular therapies. Judy. Thank you. Peter, that was a wonderful, wonderful talk. I'm gonna bring you back to where Dante left off. They've asked me to uh, talk about the safety reporting. Here are my financial disclosures. I have uh, consulted for Apalis, uh, uh, Genentech Roche, and Regeneron. So we have heard of pharmacovigilance uh, consists of collection, detection, assessment, monitoring, and prevention of adverse effects of pharmaceutical products. And we cannot minimize the importance that after a drug is approved, you, the retina specialists, and your patients are the last line of defense against adverse events. And this is done through reporting. We've heard that there are a number of different ways, the most, um, well-known well ways through MedWatch, uh, and you can do this online, where a serious adverse event, product quality problem, pr uh, product use error, as well as therapeutic failure of FDA-regulated drug, biologic, medical device, dietary supplements, or cosmetics should be reported. But as we have heard, the most common way is actually through the manufacturer reporting. We, as retina specialists, are fortunate to have another source that's through the American Society of Retina Specialists Research and Safety and Therapeutics Committee. We serve as an independent post-market data and safety monitoring uh, to help protect the patients, 
and the doctors. Okay. And we work closely with CDC, FDA, and the companies. And it's a peer-to-peer -peer reporting. The reporting is initiated by the uh, ASRS members. And uh, we generate member alerts, conduct literature reviews, draft white papers and articles, and provide members, hopefully, with the timely information that can be helpful to your patients. Here are some examples. Back in 2015, we did post-marketing analysis of aflibercept-related sterile intraocular inflammation, and we published in JAMA Ophthalmology. I presented in 2016, uh, Retina Subspecialty Day, silicone oil droplets following intravitreal injections after 21 members uh, reported over 70 cases following bevacizumab injection. Genentech um, got 33 reports of PDS septum dislodgement in 1,419 patients in August of 2022. They then did a voluntary recall in October. They came to ASRS and um, a number of my colleagues, myself, and the members of Genentech, we all worked together to formulate a Dear Healthcare Provider letter that went out to our members. And more recently with Pegsetta Copeland. Just to give you an idea of how uh, a report and then alert goes out, for instance, uh, we got a first report of panuviitis with uh, retinal occlusive vasculitis uh, related to Pegsetta Copeland, July 3rd. And then the company contacted us uh, two days later. Over the next week, in one week, we got six more cases. So because of the number and the rapidity uh, and rapidness of how these cases were accumulating, that sort of set us in motion. And there was quite a bit of uh, consultation between the company and rest committee and also outside uh, experts looking at the images. Uh, we edged adjudicated a bunch of cases, and then we decided that um, a letter of communication should go out, and it was approved by the executive committee of ASRS, and it was written off, uh, signed, uh, signed off by um, uh, Palace, the company, and then it was released on 15th of July. On July 22nd, in preparation for release of this information at ASRS annual meeting, we met with the company the executive committee of ASRS, the rest committee members, we met uh, uh, via Zoom and went over every slide that we were going to present on July 20, uh, 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 up to July 22nd, and then we presented at the uh, annual meeting. So numbers between the rest committee and the company can differ. That's not unusual. We had um, um, one retinal vasculitis and seven uh, retinal occlusive vasculitis. By then, 65,000 vials had been um, uh, dispersed. Here's one case, 91-year-old man, 2040 vision at baseline, came in 15 days after injection, 2100 vision, elevated pressure. After uh, follow-up, um, he did not improve in vision and um, stayed at around 2200 vision. And here, uh, is a summary of these cases up to July of 23. Um, many of them were between one to two weeks after injection. All but one case was after the first injection. Baseline visual acuity ranged between 2030 to 2200. The uh, most recent visit uh, visual acuity ranged between 2080 to no light perception. Yeah. It should be noted that many of them, over half of them, had elevated intractive pressure at the time of presentation, probably significant inflammation. Just one case had fibrin and no case had hypopion. And there are a number of uh, cases that have come in since, including another case from um, um, Avest uh, and Captain Pigol as well. We continue to meet with companies um, regarding their IOI status, regarding FirstMap with Genentech, a Filibercep with Regeneron. It is very important that you report, and it's very easy to do at ASR's website. There is a tab right there, and when you go in, uh, you just fill in the blanks there. And finally, I would say, Please do not uh, commit seven deadly sins of underreporting in adverse drug reaction because they are underreported. These include ignorance, diffidence, fear, lethargy, guilt, ambition, and complacency. And I want to thank the uh, ISRS Rest Committee. Thank you very much.
panelists, from Massachusetts Eye and Ear, and also Dr. Esan Rahimi from the Byers Eye Institute at Stanford. Demetrios, I know you're very shy about this, but tell us, <laughs> do you think there's a benefit-risk ratio to complement inhibition, and do you actively use complement inhibitors on your patients with GA? Uh, thank you, Diana. As you guys uh, can tell, the only person without conflict of interest is just on the panel. Um, the benefit-risk ratio is very obvious. There is zero benefit, and there is risk. Out of five, out of five functional measurements, all measurements trended worse. All measurements trended worse. If we use the same strategy that um, you look for the surrogate test and you say 70% reduction in the growth, not in the final lesion, but in the growth rate, we have minus 13% in the visual acuity from minus eight letters in the sum to minus nine in the treatment. In the reading speed, we have minus 17% in the change. In the VFQ, we have minus 5%. In the microperimetry, we have minus 12%. So all functional measurements trended downwards. We cannot claim we have a surrogate test that the surrogate test doesn't match function. At least to see some trend, positive. We saw all negative trends. We saw 12% exudation. We saw 2% of optic ischemic neuropathy or papilledema, and that could relate to this very aggressive ischemic vasculitis in one per 3,000. So we can be like ostriches and put our heads into the sand, or we can face reality. There has been zero functional benefit. Let's repeat that, zero functional benefit. Also, there has been lack of transparency from the company on how they did the statistics, because a third of the patients did not follow up the whole treatment, a third of the patients. Your statistics go all right if you have that. They don't show to us the baseline demographics and the last point of these people that discontinued. If more people with multifocal disease discontinued, of course the data will look better. So how did they measure FAF when there was exudation? Exudation increases autofluorescence. It masks the dark area of loss of autofluorescence in geographic atrophy. How did they measure that? I've read the Lancet paper that was finally published and there is zero mention, how do they measure FAF when there's exudation? The FAF will look less. Regardless of what the surrogate test showed, there is zero functional benefit and five functional metrics trend worse with additional risks. If you ask the, the question, is this treatment going to make the patient see better? No. Is this treatment going to have the patient lose less vision? No. Is this treatment going to have the patient have more risks of exudation with less vision despite treatment? Yes. Is this patient going to have the risk of optic edema, of ischemic vasculitis? And the answer is yes. So what are we treating? Do we become doctors to treat tests, or do we become doctors to see patients? The patients show clearly no benefit. Thank when you so much, Demetrius. So noted. Um, I have a similar question for us. I don't actually understand does he use it or not? <laughs> yeah. uh, the Mass General Brigham Hospital has not allowed I'm us kidding. to use it. Um, Esan, no, are you a using complement inhibition in your GA patients, and how do you select between C3 and C5 inhibition? And after you answer this, I'm really interested in the second question, and I'd like the panel to contribute to that because... Did you guys like just set me up for this right now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure, I just had a baby born two days ago, and I'm very, oh, like... Oh, that's a good start. There you go, the sympathy, the sympathy. <laughs> um, I, I do. Uh, I live in a part of the country where we have that patient demographic that they're very motivated for new therapies. They're constantly asking. They were following all these clinical trials. We live right by Genentech. A lot of these patients were following lampalizumab for years. And I think that's the first thing to keep in mind when we're dealing with this type of a patient cohort. Anything with treatments that, uh, diseases that have no treatment, neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, you're already dealing with a, a desperate patient cohort. They're desperate for anything. And I think it's very important that we keep that in mind and we also empathize with that. Um, you know, Vavas made a lot of great points. I, I think the, the reason some of these panels have such starkly different uh, responses is we're, we're fast forwarding a little bit. I, I'd, I'd argue to go back a little bit and just ask each of us, what type of doctor are you? 
you know, how you practice medicine. I think there's honestly fundamental differences in how we each practice medicine. My personal feeling, uh, I think the days of paternalistic medicine are, are long gone. You know, there was the days where the doctor was the gatekeeper. I know what's best. I know the trials. This is my interpretation. You don't ask anything. I'll tell you if I think you need it. I don't practice that way. And I, and I know that there's probably people in this room that do and don't practice that way. But I think it's very important. If you're going to have this discussion, elucidate what type of doctor you are. Because I have a lot of my patients come in. I tell them the same things. I, you know, and before even the vasculitis, I would tell them there's a 1 in 5,000 chance you're going to go blind. I make it very simple for somebody to understand. I don't say anophthalmitis. I don't say infection. That's what I quote. And it's funny because when I had the patients who were very motivated, which is what we want if you're going to give this therapy, when all the vasculitis happened, they're like, so what? You told me there's a 1 in 5,000 chance I'm going to go blind. What does 1 in 10,000 10, of vasculitis mean to me? So um, I don't oversell this. I tend to undersell it. I want patients who are going to be really compliant. That being said, I have had a lot of motivated patients. I've been pleasantly surprised myself. A lot of them are retired ophthalmologists, physicians, parents of doctors that work in our own group. I'm, I'm not here to tell them they're right or wrong, but I'm here to shepherd them through this process. Sorry, that's my long-winded. So many of the patients you know, eventually ask you, if doctor, if you were me, what would you do? I mean, eventually that's the question they ask. You know, if you were me in my position, what would you do? Well, it's tough for me to answer that because I'm trying to empathize with somebody who has GA and given their circumstances, somebody may be blind already in one eye or have you know, diminishing vision and they have potentially high functional needs. I have counseled on some colleagues and friends of mine who have parents that, that have wondered what I would do if it's my own family member. And you know, at least as long as they understand the potential risks, I would proceed with therapy. But that's me. I'm not saying I'm, I'm right or wrong or somebody else here is wrong. And C3 versus C5. I'm going to be very honest. So, well, my disclosures, by the way, so I, I, can, I do consult for both companies. I'm, I'm technically a speaker for both companies as well, too. I have not used um, any of uh, Iveric's product thus far, and I've been very open with them about that. And I think we're going to get clarity on the two-year data here at AAO. I think a lot of us are wanting to see what that shows. I personally felt the press release was very vague. <laughs> um, I think, so, <laughs> Um, I want to know what the actual, you know, granular details are. I want to know how Q4 versus Q8 did. Me personally, when I inject patients, I don't do this monthly. Um, I'm only in a Q8 or eight week or right off the bat. I just, I don't have the bandwidth in my clinic to do monthly injections. So I've only given Cypho over it today. Thank you. Dante, you have a lot of experience with complement inhibition. Mm -hmm. First, I'd like to ask you C3 or C5 if the patient had a recommendation and wanted to follow your guidance. And in addition, are you changing your practice? Do you do simultaneous bilateral injections or do you space them out because of safety concerns? I'll answer your questions, but I want to make a couple of comments to Dimitri. Somebody's got to make a comment. Um, you, you guys you know, have one of the comments. Yeah, I mean, we sort of knew in the beginning that visual acuity wasn't going to be something that we'd find a big change in. I mean, that's why we designed the trials to look at anatomical outcomes. There is, there is, if you look at certain subgroups, there is some uh, pretty interesting information as far as reducing visual loss. I think the data, the things that like Ursula is showing us tonight, today, seems to indicate that there is something going on here. Hold on a minute, but but I do think so. I so yeah, I I you know we're not going to. I don't. I'm not that surprised. We don't see a huge visual acuity benefit. Why did Re C1Q show visual acuity? Why C1Q inhibitor show the visual acuity defect? Yeah, but, yeah, but they, but then they didn't see an anatomical correlate to it. What so is more important? Yeah. I, well, I don't know. I mean, there's more to vision know? than visual acuity. You all, we all see these patients, they come in and they're 2100, I'm getting worse, doctor. They come in a year later, they're 2100, I'm worse. They are worse. There's something about their visual function that's worse that we're perhaps not measuring. So that's number one. Number two, you mentioned about the statistics or the analysis of the company. They use an MMRM uh, repeat measurement, and that's exactly the, the statistics that you do when you're missing data, when you have longitudinal data. So I think they did the right thing. There is missing data, but that, that's the right measurement. Mm, that's the right data. measurement if the missing data are equally distributed among the different risk factors. So they have right. to show that. They haven't shown that it is equally distributed risk factors yeah. in the missing data. So the MMRM is good if you don't lose that ability. But if you lose it and they haven't shown that, you can have spurious statistical right. data. Um, so what I'd say is that 
yeah, this isn't knock your socks off like neovascular AMD treatment. There is a safety risk to it. I think the safety risk, at least in my impression, is relatively low, but it's not like an endophthalmitis. It's potentially worse. I mean, you're going to, you know, these, is, they, these patients have very bad outcomes. So let me answer your questions, Diana. Uh, I don't know which one I choose. I think that I'm curious to see the two-year data for the C5 inhibition to see how it stacks up to Apelis' two-year data. I think there's, a, there's been a safety issue with ACP now with the occlusive vasculitis, and so maybe Sunil's pegged peg, peg, uh, issue, which NGM would have benefited from if they had an efficacy that non-pegylated complement inhibition might have been better. So I, that's what I would do. And I, I never would do both eyes simultaneously. I, even, even if I had already done them, I'd probably spread them out. And I really wouldn't do both eyes, I don't think. Peter, I had a question for you. What educational tools would be useful to you in clinic to demonstrate a treatment effect for patients and families? Can we use AI, you know, any videos, uh, visuals, et cetera? That would help. Did you convince them to use the drug, you mean? Yeah, so I think, you know, what Ursula's done and Sunil and Justice have done is, is really very important, which is that we, we lose photoreceptors before we see GA. And it would make sense, Ursula's shown it with, with Pegsetocoplin, uh, Justice and Sunil have shown it with, with Avas and Captain Pegol, which is the, the delta is greater in the photoreceptor preservation than, than the GA. And, that, and to me, that indicates we got to do it first of all, earlier, right? That means we're too late when we have geographic atrophy. The problem is that's where you start. Now, the next step would be to do it earlier, and, and that, that, that's where we'll go. To me, uh, you know, I agree that some patients come in and they absolutely want to go on these drugs, and they should. Um, I disagree with you, sorry. But, you know, I, it's, it's a, an informed consent. You give them an informed consent, and you go on from there. Do I think this is the end of where we are? No, this is the first chapter. I showed you what maybe is the second chapter, and hopefully we'll have a third and a fourth. But you got to start somewhere. And, and that, that's what I tell my patients. Okay. Arshad? I have a quick question for Dante. I'm a believer, too. I treat my patients with complement inhibitors. You I think real-world data is super important for these things. And having a group like RCA that can give us this massive data set is huge for the field. So I saw that you had about over 10,000 injections. You had one occlusive vasculitis. Do you know the rate of intraocular inflammation as well as just vasculitis? So I think as a field, we, our bar should be, you know, we have to look for, we are so spoiled, right, with anti-VEGF. We rarely ever see inflammation. So I think it's important for the field to know what is the real-world IOI as well as vasculitis rate. It's good to see that only one case of occlusive vasculitis happened with over 10,000 injections. Right. Yeah, we're looking at all that. I mean, part of it, you know, with real-world data is really dirty data, too. And so, you know, we have to try to collate this, go back and see if, you know, if the inflammation cases, because sometimes it's, it's documented as vitritis and other times it's anterior chamber cell and flare. And, so, you, so it's, it's a little bit a matter of cleaning things up. But yeah, and then having stay the tuned, risk, stay risk tuned. factors too, right? Like yeah. we need to know why it's happening and how we can avoid it. I think that's the key, right? Identifying the patients that may be more prone to it. As Sunil said, whether it's systemic issue, whether it's a sensitivity of something. So it would be great if you guys can contribute and publish and present the data. I think it's going to be super important. Can I, can I ask a follow-up question to what you just asked? Um, since most of these cases are happening after first injection, should we be looking at number of injections or number of people, people. injected? It should be people, I think. I mean, a lot of times we hear these per, like when you think of endophthalmitis, infectious endophthalmitis is really per injection. Whereas if it's a first time thing, there's something about the patient, you know, it's almost like an allergic reaction to the medicine. And after that it doesn't seem to happen. You don't have to worry about it. Even if they've had it in the other eye, you don't seem to get it in the new eye. So. Um, yeah, so it's per patient. That's why we looked at the 3,800 and some patients had one case of it. And actually, that case developed more recently. So you could have gone all year till about September, and we would have had zero cases of it. And there were only 1,300 patients in the clinical trials, and so they're probably that rare event. So that makes me feel good about it, too, knowing that there were that many patients didn't see an event. We saw it in about almost 4,000 cases. So... I, I just be cautious though, right? Because you guys, I mean, I think it's great you guys are doing this and I think it's really important, but you're not looking at them one week. 
two week after an injection. You know, I just heard that we're trying to make sure we're doing it every other month. You're probably not getting fluorescenes and other imaging six to 12 months. You know, the case that Judy showed that I attempted to show, it was a peripheral vasculitis <laughs> that, you know, was very apparent, but wasn't seen and wouldn't be seen and missed. So I think the next step is looking at 12, 18 months, like what's happening. I, I'm sure that a lot of these patients have subclinical disease and we're not seeing it. So this, I think, changes your risk benefit. I think we all need to be aware of it. And you know, to the question of if I'm using it, I have a half uveitis, half retina specialist, like retina clinic. I try not to create more uveitis in my life. <laughs> and so my risk, my, my, uh, my informed consent has changed and I have yet to have someone say yes when I present the data like this of the uveitis risk, which I think is potentially blinding. So can I make one point, which Sunil said, and I just want to really, because it's important that we understand. In, in the REST database, a large proportion of patients were neovascular AMD patients treated specifically with a flibercept, who then developed the complication on their first Cyfovra injection. So the question is, is there something about maybe the FC fragment of flibercept that's somehow priming these patients? We don't know. But the bottom line is, it was never tested in wet AMD. It was tested in dry AMD. And even though the FDA label says we can use it whenever the hell we want, I would caution you that we don't know anything about how patients with neovascular AMD, or even if it's the same, if it's the same mechanism of action. So really use this in dry AMD. Please don't use it in wet AMD. But Peter, theoretically, if they, had, they were allowed to have wet AMD in the fellow eye, they're still getting that systemic exposure, right, to prime them. It's possible. We don't they were allowed in the there. trials. Yeah, it's possible. I'm just saying there's a disproportionate number of patients in that REST database who were previously treated with a flibercept. I'm, I don't know what that means. I'm just saying be careful. I think these are all excellent points. I really enjoyed the discussion. We're going to move to our next session. But if anyone wants to talk to Demetrios or Esan, <laughs> we'll do it at the break. Thank you. Anna will be outside for you. <laughs> we'll invite the next panelists up to the podium, please. Gentlemen. We'll be getting some uh, chairs shortly, but there's a seat open next to Quan up front. He doesn't bite. Yes, please. Right here. Yep. All right. Hi, Dr. Fernando. How are you? Very great to see you, Roger. How many are you? Hey, over there. Nice to see you. Same here. <laughs> so, you want me on? Uh, right over there. So uh, welcome to the, our, our third session. This has been uh, riveting to this point. I'm Prithvi Murthyanjaya from Stanford. I'm joined by my co-moderator, uh, Barry Cooperman from uh, Irvine. And we will start with our first speaker. Uh, Michael Singer will be talking about non-intravitreal drug delivery. We're talking about new drug targets. Michael. Hi, everyone. Thanks for sticking in there. Here are my financial disclosures. I want to uh, reach out to Peter. He gave me a lot of help. I'm going to try not to talk about any drugs he talked about, but I'm talking about a whole lot of things in a whole, a whole short period of time. So we're going to talk about ways to get drugs to the back of the eye. You can see the slide. Arshad's going to deal with drops later. So essentially, there are a bunch of oral medications out there right now that are treating retinal disease. You get Resolute doing a phase two trial for DME. You get Occupy that just finished a phase two trial for diabetic retinopathy. You get Valo, who's currently in a phase two trial for NPDR. And you get Alcahest that finished a trial for wet AMD. We also can give shots in the arm or in the body. And obviously, Eshvata has a single shot that you can use for DME or AM or um, AMD and Ionis that Peter talked about was a shot you gave every month for geographic atrophy. Superchoroidal injections are an interesting space, and I'm really going to spend a little more time on that just because of the fact that there are products that are approved, and it's a new pathway of action. Zyper is approved for uvulitic macular edema. It's, um, the platform is very interesting. It's a 30 gauge needle, 900 or 1100 microns in length. Gene therapy, you got Regenex Bio treating wet AMD in the AVH study and diabetic retinopathy in the altitude study. There's a TKI study done by Clearside who had developed a needle, Exitinib, for wet AMD in the Odyssey trial. So basically, you can see on the left, this is Exitinib, and on the right, you can see a heat map showing RGX314. 
Obviously, you can put, you can put implants in the sclera. You can deport the delivery system or sesfemo as Rose Genentech. It's approved for wet AMD. The phase three trials for DME and NPDR have been completed. There is a voluntary recall due to septimus dislodgement. Neurotech has encapsulated cell therapy, releasing ciliary neurotrophic factor. They finished the phase three trial for macular telangiectasia. Both of those are shown in the sclera. Obviously, we have a long history of intraocular implants. You can see we've been doing it for 45 years in terms of the therapies. This is a big slide that really kind of says all these implants are different, different duration, their bioerodability, site of administration and delivery, and how long they last. The one we do know about is we know about Ozrodex. It's been around a long time. It's dexamethasone approved for RVO, DME, and uveitis. It breaks down to PLGA and water. It dissolves in six months, but the effect usually only lasts three months, and it's a 22-gauge needle. Fluocinolone comes in two different flavors. Now by Alamera, you either can have Utique, which essentially is being used and dissolved. Both of them dissolve into polyvinyl alcohol. Utique is for uveitis and Alluvian is for DME. They can last up to three years. What's important to understand, this is a 25-gauge needle. Obviously, the TKIs, I talked about one. We need to talk about the other two. Ocular Therapeutics has a bioerodible hydrogel technology that breaks down to 90% water. This is a 95-gauge needle. There's a phase one trial that was completed in the US. They're going to start phase two and phase three. And Veralanab, from my eye point, is polyvinyl alcohol breaks down, they have a 22 and 25 gauge, depending on the number of implants you're gonna put in the eye. Davio one and two have been completed. Alcon used to be called Airy. They had a PLGA implant that actually I reported at um, ASRS that was used for RVO. They're coming out with a TKI inhibitor. Um, this, they have print technology, which is very different than how they make everything else. Stay tuned, they probably will start at the beginning of next year. Basically, if you want to know anything about TKI, this is Peter's slide. I love him for it. It makes it really easy. All you need to know is basically at six months, 50% or more people do not need rescue injections. You can look at the details, and I'm sure they'll be presented at great length tomorrow. So what, let's talk about the injector type. So this is an accordion. We showed this before. This is the Ozrodex dexamethasone, and basically you can push down. The faster you push down, the faster it goes in. Alluvian has a push down and slide. Utique has a 25-gauge plunger. Um, and depending on the size, I told you that before. Um, Davio is a 22 or 25 gauge implant. OTX, you basically depress it. And the supracoroidal, we talked about the two different needle sizes, short and long. This obviously is the gyroscope concept, but it's still interesting. The orbit subretinal delivery system, really, you can canalize through the choroid and punch through into the retina. I think, although the study didn't make any significance, I think the advantage of the technology is fascinating, and I think it may be used again going forward. Subretinal surgery, a lot of co companies are doing retinal, subretinal surgery. This is not an exhaustive list, but obviously Genex Bio has a phase three wet AMD program. ADDC, which is called Beacon, has an X-linked RP. You've got RG6501, which essentially has um, studies for GA. Estellas is, is in the process of developing another GA drug that's also going to be subretinal therapy. So we're gonna talk about technology you may not have thought of. Excuse me, we spend our life in the back of the eye, I wanna talk about the front of the eye, the canaliculus. So there are two drugs we're gonna talk about that are in the canaliculus, one is Evolute and one is Dextenza. Evolute is a punctal plug that is giving Pafinac and Dexamethasone. They have finished their phase two trial, they're going to the phase three, it stays in there and you have to take it out, it does not dissolve. The other one is Dextenza, which is currently approved for post-operative inflammation after cataract surgery. It's also being used for vitrectomy surgery. A great article by Ivan Senior showed that you can get rid of some inflammation with this. In the spirit of Innovate, I'm gonna show you something you've never seen before. I developed a punctal plug forcep, which we use for dry eyes, that essentially, I'm gonna show you here, is being used for the Dextenza process. At one side, it's a negative action forcep. On the other side, it's a measure punctal dilator. And I'm happy to say it's going to be sold for the first time tomorrow at AAO. That's my own plug. I have no financial disclosure because I haven't gotten paid. All right. In summary, many potential platforms are available for drug delivery technology. The goals of these are increased compliance by decreasing the burden and the trauma of visits and injections. And if we provide more sustainable therapies, this should lead to better patient adherence and better results for our patients in the long term. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Michael. Next up, I didn't realize we were alternating. Thanks, Frithri, for letting me know.
<laughs> Next up is Arshad Kanani, dear friend from Re Reno. Just an eye drop, topical delivery technology. They gave you the best topic of all. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Uh, thank you, Prithvi, Steve, uh, Diane, and Quan for inviting me. And these are my disclosures. I do uh, serve as a co-PI for the Oculus uh, Diamond study. So, you know, drops are not sexy, right? But every patient asks about drops. When you say you have DME, you have DR patient, we have great treatment is injectables. And when we tell the patient, they're like, well, do you have a drop? Do you have a pill? So actually, this is a very timely topic for us because we know under treatment is rampant in terms of treating DR, a DME. And also DR patients don't want to get continuous injections. So the question is, can we have topical drops so we can address this in a non-invasive way, and it's not for all patients, but for a subset of patients. So OCS01 is the only topical drop that's in the phase three program that's actually looking to treat DME. And as Michael showed, we have dexamethasone implant uh, uh, approved for treatment of DME. So the idea is that can we get a topical formulation? It's a unique product. It, it has this OptiReach technology that actually takes the drug to the back of the eye and we have validated uh, this eye drop in exploratory and phase two uh, studies in DME, and I know Ramin is here, he was very involved with that. And then that led to the, the pivotal uh, phase, phase three program. So what is this phase two, three diamond study? The stage one uh, is completed, and I'm gonna present the data of that, uh, share it with you. And the, and the idea was to optimize dosing and to see biological activity and you'll see the data that it actually did both of those. So we took uh, patients who had central involving DME, 100 were treated with OCS, 48 were treated with vehicle drops, and there was an induction phase where patients received six times a day dosing for six weeks, okay. and then after that, they received three times a day. The primary endpoint was mean change in BCVA uh, score from baseline to, to week, uh, week six. And here are the results, o patients on OCS01 had a significant improvement in mean BCVA from baseline at week six and 12. And you look at the p-value, uh, 0.007 for the primary endpoint, 7.2 letter gains in the patient's treated with OCS versus 3.1 in the vehicle. And then that effect continued uh, with three times a day dosing and we saw maintenance of visual acuity at the end of 12 weeks. In terms of uh, three-line gainers, I think this is super important uh, for our patients, you know, to keep their driver license, to improve their vision. And you can see that, again, the p-value is very significant, and 25% of patients at week six with OCS compared to 10% in the vehicle group, and the similar number at week 12. Now, of course, vision and other things can people can say, it's just fluctuation. Well. The proof is in the pudding in, in anatomy. So look at this anatomy. You see effect of OCS on CST were observed early. You see a significant decrease in CST by two weeks. And then this is maintained throughout the study, even moving from induction phase uh, to maintenance phase. Safety is important even for a drop. Uh, it was well tolerated with no unexpected adverse events. It's a steroid eye drop, so we know that we will have increased IOP in patients who are treated. That was 14% versus 2.1% in the vehicle, but the good thing about a drop is that you can stop the drop if you have increase in IOP. The other thing to note here is that IOP increases were not very high. They were consistent with what's in the literature, and it stayed the same between induction and, uh, and maintenance phase. So the last one uh, is OTT166. This is a topical drop for diabetic retinopathy. Again, we have great treatment as an anti-VEGF, but because of the invasive nature and the burden, most of us don't treat NPDR patients. So this is a pan-RGD binding integrin inhibitor with an anti-VEGF activity. We know that targeting integrins is a novel approach in the treatment of diabetic retinopathy. So how does this work? You have topical OTT166. It's distributed through the scleral route to the retina due to a high membrane permeability. What is the evidence? Uh, first in human phase 1b. Uh, of OTT-166 in DR patients demonstrated safety and tolerability. It was a, it enrolled 44 patients and the idea was to see is there a biological signal? Yes, 
Is it safe? Yes. So what's going on now, the phase two DREAM study has fully recruited. This is a large study with 210 patients looking at high dose, which is 5% five, 5 uh, four times a day, lower dose 5% twice a day compared to placebo. And this has recruited patients uh, with moderate severe to severe NPDR or mild uh, PDR. And primary endpoint is the regulatory endpoint of percent of patients with two-step or greater improvement. The data will be reading out uh, first uh, half of next year. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Arshad. Our next speaker is Dr. David Brown. He'll be talking about biosimilars in today's practice environment. David? Thank you very much. We're going to kind of change, uh, change uh, pass here from new and innovative to uh, uh, things that are taking over every field in our f medicine and now finally coming to ophthalmology. So I'm not really going to uh, wake you up to a brand new field, but show you some interesting things that you may not know about biosimilars and about our current drugs. So basically, consulting fees for a bunch of people and stuff, but that doesn't matter. So US patents for ranibizumab and aflibercept expired in 2020. However, the dosing patents for aflibercept still haven't expired. So those ongoing litigations are still going on, and that's why you have new ranibizumab biosimilars. The European patents expired 2022 and 2025, uh, just coming out. Uh, biosimilars are biotechnology products comparable with an already approved product. And it should demonstrate similarities, but doesn't have to be exactly the same. In other words, it has to show a lot of pharmacological uh, uh, similarities and work like the, work like the comparator, uh, and be similar in efficacy to the innovator biologic. So they require living cells, usually either hamster cells or, or uh, E. coli or comparable genetic tissues. And most people use whatever the reference product to use. Uh, whether it's ranibizumab or flibercept. They have to be stability, immunogenicity. The manufacturing process can be very different. And you have to reverse engineer the project. And the Koreans and Japanese are really good at that. They've done it with TVs and cars, and now they're doing it with biosimilars. <laughs> and that's actually some of the biggest competitors now in the biosimilar market. Uh, uh, the investment in research is a lot. Like, it costs millions and millions of dollars to build these things. And, but it's millions and billions of dollars in drug if they actually make it right. So now we have two different biosimilars that are out for ranibizumab. One's FYB201 and Gavia that is marketed as similarly. It got uh, licensed by Coherus. And then Biogen's product, SB11, uh, which was, came from Samsung, uh, and that's called BioViz. And not to violate CME stuff, but just if it's biosimilar, they all sound the same. And, I'm not going to call it FYB201 or SB11 or FQPWRS anyway. <laughs> so these, the, inter the most interesting thing is not the biosimilars you see in our clinic now. Like the biosimilars you see in our clinic now are two from ranibizumab. And ranibizumab is a fantastic drug. Some of the best papers ever written in the history of ophthalmology are on ranibizumab. <laughs> Phil and I are in the audience. But it, uh, <laughs> ILEA biosimilars, we have eight coming out. And to be honest, there's 22, according to Regeneron, that are in production. So the big market's going to be this aflibercept biosimilar market, and we think that's somewhere mid-next year to later on, depending on the dosing patents. So I'm going to show you a couple of things just to pro provoke your thought. Uh, more than what I did, and not to irritate anyone, I have three beautiful daughters that are incredibly smart, and I am the farthest from sexist, I hope. <laughs> but if you, if you look at aspirin as... The size of aspirin, that's sort of a smaller molecule, it's a bigger, smaller molecule. Compared to an antibody, it's a very, very smart, very, very small amount. So it is a very difficult thing to make the molecule exactly like uh, and, and make it happen. And it turns out that the drugs we use every day, like ranibizumab and aflibercept, you think it's the same drug that we used 10 years ago, 20 years ago. But I'm going to show you that's not, not the case. When you make it in human cultures, it's kind of like sourdough bread starter. Like you, you make sourdough bread and every day it's a little different or beer it's a little different. It's the same thing with these biologics. I don't mean to simplify it. But what I'm going to show you is there's various models to attribute to the fingerprint and they have to prove that the fingerprint is close. They don't have to prove that it's exact. 
And you can, there's like constellation patterns, there's higher order structure. I'm gonna go fast here because we're almost done. But the manufacturing changes over the years based on your biologic product. And there's some that can affect the way the product works, and there are some that others. And this is the most impressive, oh, it didn't show that slide. Here we go. There's a cumulative drift. In other words, the drug changes over time. So the drug you used 10 years ago, mm. ranibizumab, Lucentis, came in an orange package. It looks the same, but it's different. And this shows you the most. It's peptide mapping. Mm. And it shows you that there has been differences throughout time between the European and the US. And so if you're thinking about a biosimilar, is it exactly the same as what? As the one we're using today? As the one when it was approved? As the one 10 years ago? And so it's a very complex structure. And so you have to trust the regulators. And you want to, I, think, I think the main point of this is that you want a manufacturer that's been doing this a long time, that's made a lot of biosimilars in oncology and rheumatology, and not just you know, a, a one buy or a company that, or a country that doesn't have as much regulation, uh, because there's a lot of difficulty maintaining that quality uh, that you really have to trust the regulators and trust that your drugs are still working. So from there, we're going to go to the economics and stuff, but that's all my talk. Thanks, Dave. Next up, e economics and biosimilars, the good and the bad. Robbie Perrett. Hey, thanks for having me. It's crazy. It is. So it's crazy. Um, here are my disclosures. People don't know. And I will also be talking about the off-label use of some medications. And so uh, our group uh, originally published a few years back that the amount of uh, injections that are happening and the number of patients getting injections is consistently increasing in the United States. And that's a, not necessarily a bad thing because it's a great treatment and more patients are getting access to vision-saving treatments. But what is a concern, and not just to ophthalmologists, but this is something that's kind of on a, you know, one of the th one thing in ophthalmology that a lot of the health policy, government people care about is basically the rising costs of these drugs. And this isn't a unique issue only in the US. Um, our group also published that globally in the UK and also, in, for example, in Asia, you know, most of the AMD and diabetes is actually in Asia, right? That it's such a big impact to the, the, many of these countries' healthcare budgets that it's also a big concern to the GDP overall. And so there need to be low cost options. So in the United States, there's repackaged bevacizumab and it's low cost because it's repackaged. And in many other countries, uh, biosimilars have taken a much more of a hold. For example, in India, which has been a real innovator in the biosimilar space. And so one of the major concerns, at least here, is that there's going to be an on-label bevacizumab. Um, they've already going through approval. Um, and the expectation, although it has not yet been approved, is that an on-label bevacizumab will be approved. And that's concerning because based on FDA guidelines of the Drug Safety and Quality Act, um, compounding pharmacies cannot compound a copy of one or more approved drugs. So once bevacizumab is on-label, the low-cost option is going to be unavailable. And we see this not just in the letter of the law, but there's already a precedent. Uh, Ziveflibercept is the oncological version of aflibercept, uh, but it's not available in the United States because of this law. And even though the medication has been shown to be safe and effective, um, in, for example, in this paper, in BJO, and you know, has been used for many years in India, for example. Um, but in the United States, we can't get it because of both the letter of the law and this precedent in the same area of medicine, oncology to ophthalmology. And so, what is the paradox here? So in this case, we may end up having a situation where based on the current prices, biosimilars end up increasing this problem. Um, so for example, our paper just came out in the September issue of ophthalmology that if we price the new bevacizumab at $500, which is a conservative price, more likely, I've been hearing from people at the academy and others I work with, it's probably gonna be more around 900. But the price of the anti-VEGF to the system and also to keep in mind to patients, will increase by about 15% to about 30%. And the scary thing is, here we can see the cost of bevacizumab in purple, that even if every single person currently on ranibizumab or aflibercept were switched to a biosimilar, that would still only account for 
less than a third of the increase in costs. So the over, as an aggregate from biosimilars or even the price going down, it would have to be at least 16% if priced at 500 and obviously more if the price is higher. So, you know, many would argue, however, getting bevacizumab isn't safe everywhere. For example, just last month in Pakistan, you can't get bevacizumab because of a big outbreak. So what's the option of a low-cost uh, treatment? So in India, we see that um, with more and more biosimilars coming out, the price has officially dropped to about 100 and is even lower, which some of our panelists will mention after certain rebates and promotions. And could that same thing happen in the United States? So the real uh, game changer is going to be when an aflibercept uh, biosimilar comes out. Here is a recent publication about Samsung's aflibercept uh, biosimilar. And, but there are many companies bringing things on the market. Is there going to be trust for all the different companies? These are all things that we all have to consider. And another concern, which our group has previously published, that will the price go down, like in places like India? Uh, as you know, we don't really negotiate prices in the United States. And here's a study that I published looking at the US and Australia, showing that the prices in the US were actually the same or lower, and in some cases have gone up or have pretty much stayed flat. And, and so will there really be a lower, that much of a lower cost biosimilar? And then is it you know, worth it, or will there be a good uptake? And so in summary, we need to have a low cost option, whether that's repackaged bevacizumab that's been safe and effective, or, or biosimilars. And so I think it's important that we have ASRS and AO is working on this, and everyone here also is involved in advocating for this. Because I think we all realize that as prices go up, there'll be less access. And so when medically appropriate, there should always be a low cost option for the patients. Thank you. Thanks very much. We'll now begin our panel. I wanted to also um, welcome Dr. Raja Narayanan uh, here from the LV Prasad Eye Institute in Hyderabad. We'll get his uh, input as well. Barry, you want to go first? Sure. So again, we're going to jump into biosimilars in a bit, but first we had some other questions. Arshad. Um, so that's interesting technology, the Oculus. How would you envisage with a drop like that that you would use it? Again, with a steroid, that, you know, there's presumably going to be some kind of IOP issues and cataract issues, but is this something that you would consider using early before you consider injections or as adjuvant therapy with injections, assuming it was sort of available? And given the fact that even though it looked like it was reducing excess macular thickness pretty well, 60 microns is probably not the full 150 that I'm guessing that they probably were as is usual. No, those are, those are all the valid questions. And I think we have enough patients who have early disease where we just observe and because of the risk and benefit of injections and the treatment burden. So that's the population. And of course, you have to wash the lens. I mean, this was a three-month trial, but I would assume that if you do, when the next stage is one year, we will see some increase in cataract as expected with steroids. So I think that, and then we have, you know, and you have published that a lot, uh, Barry, on the suboptimal responders where you do anti-VEGF injections and they get improvement, but they're never dry. So I think those patients can benefit. So this is not taking away the injections. This is treating early patients or in combination to, to help our patients with DME. That's an important point because, again, the way at least my treatment strategy is, those that are the suboptimal responders, I tend to use, I switch to DEX implant monotherapy, not combination, but many have argued, and the science would point to the fact that both should be used in combination, but I don't want to really give both injections, but this would be, to me, a nice way to do combination therapy, treating both the, uh, the steroid, all the inflammatory cytokines, in addition to, of course, the VEGF pathway. So interesting work there. Michael, um, you covered a lot of topics. Um, in other parts of medicine, we think of polypharmacy, and if we look at the TKI data, uh, it looks promising. Do you see this as being true monotherapy, or are we going to be in a, in a point where we have to use more than one injection? And we know some of the pitfalls that we're seeing currently with using two, two drugs in one eye. What are your thoughts looking into the future? So, I mean, Barry, you know, even just touched on the concept that, you know, looking at it holistically, are you, one of the things that I always like to do is if we look at our field, you want to see a fast forward of our field, take a look at oncology. God forbid you get breast cancer in 2023, nobody's treating you with one drug. We are starting to learn the benefits of the fact that all our pathways need to be controlled with, with a cocktail. Yes. 
And as we start getting forward, I see the TKIs being part of that cocktail. Even the way the trials are designed, they all seem to have run in with anti-VEGF. So again, they're getting that cocktail on board to get to the stability phase. I think over time, we published data on anti-VEGF and, and dexamethasone implants a decade ago, and one thing we were able to show again and again and again is that you basically it lasted exactly four months, and it went from there. So I do believe over time, we're gonna have more medicines that we use as a toolbox and not just use a hammer or a screwdriver, we use a little bit of both. You showed uh, the panel of uh, all the TKIs. What, uh, what, are you th what are your thoughts on hedging your bets and which TKI looks most promising to you? I don't know, I mean, th this, is, this definitely is a horse race and what I've learned in my life watching all these things, early phase st studies look really good and you know, the devil's in the details when you get to phase three. So we'll see what happens with phase three and obviously safety profiles will be something that works in. Um, I'm glad that 50% of people, at a minimum, don't need shots at six months. Because you know, when you poll retina specialists around the country, how long do you think you should have a medicine last for? The number six months comes up a lot because you still want to see your patients, but you'd rather not be bothered every month. So again, I'm happy to know that the worst case scenario, we got 50% 50, 50 and we may have better than that. Raja, the uh, experience in India with biosimilars is uh, you know, vast. Um, since 2015, when I think the first ones were approved, um, what has been the, the challenges in, um, in kind of the broad acceptance of this and your experience that you can share with us? Yeah, thanks, Prithvi. Um, yeah, India was the first uh, country to approve ranibizumab biosimilar, but it soon ran into trouble because of ocular inflammation. But if that inflammation had occurred in today's age with all the vasculitis, occlusive vasculitis, it wouldn't probably have made so much noise at that point of time. But having said that, uh, the uh, manufacturer Intas did, uh, did a lot of research and they found out the endotoxin levels were, even though they were within the acceptable, acceptable range, uh, the FDA and EMA at that time, they reduced it from 0.5 to 0.2 endotoxin units, and then from that time onwards, it has been found to be pretty safe. But at the same time, in, in, in December 2016, Avastin ran into a big problem with spurious Avastin uh, causing end of thalmitis and a lot of patients losing vision. So Ranibizumab biosimilar actually took the market share of Bavacizumab and not on the innovative drug of Bavac uh, Ranibizumab. So that was the uh, market force uh, dynamics which was playing at that time. And the other important thing is since India is uh, a free market, competitive uh, market like uh, patients pay out of pocket, so uh, pricing did uh, uh, is, it's a price sensitive market. So the innovative Ranibizumab was uh, priced at $1,000 uh, when it started, but now the innovative Ranibizumab is priced at 250 USD because of the biosimilars coming in. And the biosimilar itself, with all the discounts being offered to the providers, it's, it's, a, it's about $80 uh, for one shot. So again, uh, thank you, Raj. And if, thanks for the great presentation. Um, so I had not appreciated how much there was sort of a drift over time. Do you anticipate that there'll be changes in immunogenicity, immunogenicity or efficacy over time? I mean, we've not seen it overtly, but, and how do the biosimilars react to that? Again, as you pointed out, what are we creating biosimilars to? They are complex molecules. They're not anything like generics. They have similar binding co coefficients, but otherwise it could be quite different. But what about this drift concept? You know, it's, it's amazing that the drugs work that well for that long. It may be that we're so over the, the, the VEGF level to antibody blockade that you really need that it doesn't matter. Uh, you know, it does matter in, say, birth control and other things where hormones are incredibly tightly correlated. It may not matter as much. But it's, you know, we don't do comparative studies where we see are we getting as many letters gained today as we did 10 years ago. Uh, but the FDA is comfortable with the uh, safety profile, and it, it's it's interesting. You're, it's really a leap of faith that and that your drugs are the same because they're not. And then, like I said, I think it really matters that you need an Amgen, a Biogen, a big company that's been around the block and done a bunch with a bunch of drugs. 
uh, before you take the lowest cost provider and the Blue Cross aluminum or whatever says you got to use this one particular drug, right? Well, that's another point that wasn't really raised, but obviously in the clinical trials, which are curtailed because the development of the biosimilars is really in the science up front, and to get into, there's these classic drawings of, of an inverted pyramid, which is the development of an originator molecule with a little bit of the science beginning, but every step beyond that. There's a lot of science, but the trial, by the time you get to the trials, it's a huge investment, whereas the biosimilars have an inverted pyramid. It's a lot more science at the bottom, and by the time you get to the clinical trial, trial stage, you're much curtailed, but they end up with uh, similar efficacy and safety. They pay a lot of attention to immunogenicity, so certainly the immunogenicity of the current ranibizumab biosimilars was matched with the originator Lucentis ranibizumab. So there's no question they're testing it against today's molecule, not the molecule from 15 years ago. Yeah, it's fascinating. I mean, we've had a lot of discussions with those of us who are back in the dark ages, Peter and, and Jeff and Phil, and how lucky we were, right? We had these molecules that just really were safe. And, you know, every time we've tried to get new, greater molecules, sort of, it's, there's been small percentage side effects that have, that have derailed it. And so maybe we were incredibly lucky, or maybe the designers were, you know, really good at the beginning. Uh, but, you know, the more you try to uh, improve, you, you have to make sure that it's at least as safe as the originator products. And uh, I have, you know, the, uh, I, I made light of it, but, you know, copying uh, the reverse engineering, you know, the, the ability to, to reverse engineer ranibizumab, I think, is way easier than the ability to create a whole new molecule. So That brings up a good point, and we'll get to some of the uh, economics of, of this. In my academic practice, we don't have uh, use of biosimilars at this point, but in you know, my colleagues that are in uh, you know, thriving private practices, this is a, a reality. And it gets to Ravi's paper too, and, and I'll open it to the panel. You know, is, this, is there going to be an incentivization of using biosimilars? Is that going to change how we decide what the best treatment is? And it gets to efficacy of the biosimilar itself. So, uh, Ravi, I'll give you the first stab at this. I think we kind of know where you're coming from it, but I think this is pertinent to the whole panel. Well, I, th I think the, the most important thing is that actually we know most of these are effective, and they're being shown to be effective pretty well. By the, everyone criticizes the FDA, but drugs come out in the U.S. first, for the most part, and um, part of that's because of the financial gain. But, so, but also the FDA does a really good job of making sure something is effective and safe. And so I think the biggest issue is actually the safety. So, you know, bevacizumab, maybe someone would rather want that if they if between that and a biosimilar because there's way more data, clinical data. And I think the other thing we have to also consider is um, it, the important thing is what is the clinically distinguishable difference. And right now the main thing is on safety. And so um, before people kind of, oftentimes these conversations start turning towards one drug might be more effective than the other. But I think the real issue is if you can't show that clinically or a safety issue, then it's not going to hold water. Oh, sure. so can I make a comment? Yeah. yeah, so I'm in private practice, busy private practice, and every time a biosimilar company comes, they don't show me the data or the science. They, send me, they tell me I'm going to make more money. So, so I think it's just good for the companies to dive into the data and the science and remember, these are first-generation molecules. We are at second generation, right? We are at Babismo, I mean, Ferisimab and high-dose ILEA, or Aflibercept. And my question always is, what would I do if my, and most of my patients, just disclosure, are fully covered. And I'm not saving the system too much money, as Ravi showed, by using this drug. So to me, if I have the flexibility to use anything I would for my mother, what would that drug be? And I think I asked the audience, who would use a biosimilar versus a Wabismo or high dose ILEA? I mean, that's the question you have to ask yourself. And, and there's no, no right or wrong answer here. I think you need to be into the science, you need to be into the comfort zone, as Raja was saying. But sometimes payers in private practice want us to step through a biosimilar and we don't have a choice. So I think the argument is very different when you have choice and you're using it because you're making more money versus you don't have a choice and you're using it and you believe in it. But just to add to that, and I agree with what you're saying, the, the, the economics are, and incentivization is clear, but there's, again, both the doctor's benefit, but there's the societal benefit. Because even though the doctor is getting a bigger piece of the pie, 
the overall drug cost is lower and, and the community as a whole and the governmental expenditure does go down. And so there's that greater good, which a lot of the patients are aware of and are asking for. So there's many cost conscious patients. They know it's free. All my patients also are fully covered, but they like the notion if this is as good as, and it's somehow they're, in a certain sense, a modest contribution to the societal cost of the drug. That's no, no, I agree, our, but I think that if you look at the delta, though, Ravi showed you, the delta is not hundreds. It's not. I wish it was Yeah, but it should right. go down over exactly, time. Yeah. As, so as, in as oncology, as the yeah. cost went down 20% when biosimilars right. came out. And you would expect that, as it did in India, right. you know, it started at, what, 250 U.S. equivalent, and now it's down to 80. You know, when we have 20 aflibercept biosimilars, it should really decrease the cost as long as we can keep the safety up. And, and, and respectfully, if, is it really safer to give grandma the brand new hot new drug with the ads on TV, or is it better to give her a drug that's been out for 20 years that we know ranibizumab is incredibly safe, very little inflammation, works in you know, 90% great in AMD. I think it's probably safer to give random, grandma ranibizumab. Well, you just pointed out that today's ranibizumab drifted far away from right. old ranibizumab. Can't have it both ways. <laughs> but it still ads, works. Though the ads on TV are great. Um, Mike Singer, last question. Is, uh, are the, is the- Heidi Klum's amazing. Just, is the involvement of biosimilars in our field going to stifle innovation for new innovative drugs to come out? I don't think so. I mean, I think biosimilars are just a, a, a natural progression of what's going to happen. Because to be honest, biosimilars are biosimilars to older drugs. I mean, you know, you have your, the first one was aranabizumab biosimilar. Aranabizumab is not typically the drug that Genentech is promoting more. They're happy looking at farisimab running forward. And at Flibercept, you're going to have high dose alia. It's first generation. I think some of the issues that are going to come up is really we don't, I mean, Archad, I wish we had free, pay, free reign on every patient that comes in. I think we're put in lanes. I mean, you know, you're put in a bevacizumab lane, you're put in a ranibizumab lane, you're put in a flibercep lane, and then you're put in a, you know, new lane. And the question would be, and someone to talk about this, some of my biosimilar patients, I mean, they, I'll put them on when I have, for, from an economic standpoint, their cost sometimes is zero for both the injection and the medicine. But the reality is they'll let me use a biosimilar or Avastin. So which one am I going to do? I know from the, the data that a ranibizumab, any way you slice it, is a better drying agent than Avastin. Every study has shown it. And safer. And, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I don't use much bevacizumab. So my, my comment was if, I, if we have the right. choice. Well, of course. And that's, I mean, because the outcomes also matter, right? If you can have less injections, you can have better disease control, you know the real world outcomes will be better. I mean, I think if I use a biosimilar, as I said, I disclose to the patient that I, I have other options. I'm using it because it saves society some money. I make more money. And I think that's, that's pretty straightforward. But I think we will see like five years when there's no profit left, how many biosimilars get utilized. I think that's the feel like we are looking now, but the ASPs are going to drain down. And then payers are going to not let us use the second generation agent. We have to innovate. Right. And all of us are innovators. And I think that's, they have a fit. But if I have a choice, I'm not using it as first line. Oh, absolutely. Our shot is the Robin Hood of Retina. The last comment will be to. Uh... <laughs> right. If I can, I just one last point that safety is an important factor. And in India, bevacizumab became very unsafe. And that's why initially uh, ranibizumab biosimilar was not lapped up by the retina specialist, but when bevacizumab became a problem, that's when uh, ranibizumab biosimilar picked up. Thank you to this wonderful panel and for your attention. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna go ahead and get started here with section four. Section four is uh, my personal favorite. It's, it's unique in the retina meeting uh, genre and that we're talking specifically to retina specialists about ways to be involved in the innovation ecosystem. And so this is called the Young uh, Innovators Forum. We're gonna start things off today with a talk by Cindy Till. She's gonna be talking to us about an academic career feeding innovation from academia into industry. Cindy. Thanks very much. And thank, thank you for the um, invitation to take part in Innovate um, and moving right along. Um, I don't have to do disclosures because this is a non-CME part. Um, Back in 1995, I became director of the Duke Biophysics Laboratory. Um, 
when it was handed off by Bob Mockamer, and we worked with Greasehaber and Alcon on microinstrumentation for surgery. A lot of things from going from levered cannulas to um, all around handles and all sorts of things, um, and a lot of stuff that's buried inside the um, vitrectomy system. In 2005, I switched over and, and changed the biophysics lab into an OCT imaging laboratory. I'd also co founded the Duke OCT Reading Center with Glenn Jaffe. And the reason I'm describing the different backgrounds is these are different ways that we can interact with industry. The OCT Reading Center doesn't license or sell or transfer any devices, but provides support that's used for clinical trials, for instance, um, internationally. Um, Joseph Isaac, who was one of the Cohen, uh, who was involved in early research in OCT, um, came to Duke in 2001. and. He spun off and I was able to assist with the um, movement into medicine of the use of their handheld OCT system. We've been working with both Leica and with Zeiss on intraoperative OCT. And I'm the co-founder and chief medical officer for Thea Imaging, which is um, developing the handheld OCT system you see on the lower left um, for investigational use now. But I've also been on the academic side, chairing APNT, vice chair clinical research. I, um, I think because of my conflict, I was allowed to serve on all the conflict of interest committees and overseeing text transfer. And we found that it's, it's really useful for us to think of where we are at the university and how we relate to industry. The university mission is discovery, innovation, finding cures. And these are a list of mission statements. You can look through, pick any of them out. They're all comparable, adapted from ophthalmology research programs. If you look at vision healthcare industry, whether we're talking about pharmaceuticals, technology, IT, life science tools, enterprise engineering, or delivery, staffing, marketing of healthcare, um, their missions, although they're similar, they do echo goals of universities, but they have different endpoints. And particularly as you read through these, it's important to recognize the industry has a profit responsibility and the interests of the organization are different from those of the university. So clinical trials are one of the most common partnerships with industry. So we can have industry sponsored. I've been involved in investigator initiated where Genentech supported the AREDS2 ancillary OCT study. So a multi-center study to get SDOCT out there along with the early AREDS study. Um, and that database has actually been useful and has moved forward to generate AI information now, um, or AI approaches to AMD now. You can license assets developed within the university and take those through clinical trial phases, establish company, spin out, or a startup. So why do universities support this? The Bayh-Dole Act in the US um, in 1980 for federal research says the university is entitled to retain ownership of inventions that are created as a result of federal funding and they have an obligation to attempt to develop and commercialize those inventions, use the excess um, revenue to support the enter research enterprise and share it with the inventors. So I'm going to blast through seven effective pro processes and in academic industry collaborations. One, assess the strength and competition. Know your capabilities, those of your university. Collaborate with companies that have complementary or supplementary strengths. Align your goals with, or work with organizations whose goals align with your own. Recognize the differences between your goals. Know your purpose, do your homework, be prepared, and make a clear pitch. At the heart of most successful collaboration, I think this is one of the most important, single point of contact for each side. Our bureaucratic systems in the university and those in a company can be disjointed and those can derail um, collaborations. Trusted disclosures, and those can involve intellectual property, regulatory issues, and conflicts of interest. And it's important to address these, obviously, up front. And these are often the biggest sticking point to getting this moving forward. Again, the one-on-one -on -one connection can get you through this. Co-locating personnel is one way to jumpstart or um, get past um, some of the issues that are hard to achieve um, with working at two separate sites. Finally, flexibility and open-mindedness, um, collaborating in a variety of ways, and diverse participants bring in diverse study participants, so diverse leaders in clinical research mean that you'll have um, diverse 
participants in your studies. So the partnership has a strength to the university, both the research groups, the faculty, and also for education, trainees, training in entrepreneurship, and leadership training. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy. Our next speaker is Tom Chula, who will be uh, speaking on climbing the ladder in industry, where to go next. Very interested to learn where to go next, Tom. Oh, thank you very much. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, transitioning into industry as opposed to climbing the ladder within industry because I do get a lot of calls from colleagues who have been in practice for a while and they, they want to try uh, working in industry. And um, I went back and got my MBA after about 20 years. And um, the thesis of my talk um, is that physicians should be in leadership positions, not just in academia, but throughout the healthcare ecosystem. So in, in the hospital systems, um, in government healthcare agencies, um, and also in industry. It's it, because we as physicians uniquely know the patient journey. We know the limitations of treatment. We know some of the challenges and, and the realities of, of introducing new therapies clinically. And if you're able to couple those skills with an interest in merging um, some business principles with, with science and unmet need, it can be very interesting and gratifying. I also think the, the distinction between an academic career and clinical practice and industry is starting to um, decrease. I think that academia, as we heard from Cindy, um, often comes up with ideas, and then industry will sponsor those ideas, organize a phase three clinical trials, get drugs approved, and then the clinicians are the ones who really you know, do the trials in their practices, and Dave Eichenbaum was supposed to talk about that. Um, I, I've had, uh, really, I, I think, just a lot of fun in my career, and, and when, if, you, if you take the 50,000-foot view, um, all of us have had, been blessed with just an amazing time in medicine to be a retina specialist. We've seen just an amazing degree of innovation in anti-VEGF therapies that have helped millions of patients. And then we had, um, in our field, the very first gene therapy, not in ophthalmology, but in all of medicine, happened to be in retina. And, and then we've had diagnostic innovations, um, as, as well as surgical innovation. So it's been a lot of fun. So I, I, I was an undergraduate at Harvard, then went to UCSF, trained at Mass Ioneer, um, was faculty at IU, um, and then joined a large uh, academically oriented private practice, did lots of research trials, and basically at the end of 20 years found myself doing lots of injections, even in the trials. So went back and got an MBA, and then I got to work in these four companies, and it was really fun. So at, at Ivorick, I, I helped design the GATHER one trial, at Spark, I worked on the uh, approval and launch of Luxterna, the very first gene therapy. At Clearside, worked on drug delivery. We got Zypir approved and then led an IND for a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And now I'm at Viridian Therapeutics. I purposely went outside of retina to kind of broaden my horizons. So it's an autoimmune company working on antibody engineering. The first asset is thyroid eye disease. We just announced another asset, an anti-FCRN, which will probably be used in myasthenia gravis. So it's been a lot of fun to do this. And, and I do get a lot of calls about making this transition. I want to put a plug in for some of the, the books that I've read. These are books that are often read, uh, often uh, recommended by um, executive coaches. So one of them is Transitions uh, by William Bridges. And uh, it's a wonderful book. He talks about these three phases, this, this letting go of, of your old identity, this neutral zone, which is very uncomfortable, where you're often learning a great deal and then a new beginning. And this is another schematic. It's almost like the Kubler-Ross phases. Uh, another uh, schematic of denial, resistance, exploration, and commitment. Two other books I want to mention uh, are, are these two. One is by Clayton Christensen. He's a very famous Harvard Business School professor who uh, coined the term disruptive innovation. He was a, a devout Mormon, had a large family. Um, and he had some interesting sections in his book. One was finding happiness in your career, another was finding happiness in your relationships, and a final section was staying out of jail. And this other book um, by Arthur Brooks, From Strength to Strength, is, is very worth of reading. He talks about how early in your career, you know, you've learned a lot, 
and you're good at applying it, whereas later in your career, your analytical skills may decrease. And instead of bucking that trend, in order to um, make the most out of the second wave is to go into fields like teaching and leading. And I think industry provides some of those opportunities. So I'm gonna quickly cover these last two slides, some barriers to transition. Often you're, you yourself are your own barrier with being risk adverse or lacking confidence. There's financial reasons, age reasons, family commitments, colleagues who are skeptical and geography. And then finally, where do you go next? So if, if you want to have a little bit of a pivot in your career, you could lead a larger unit with your institution. You could change industries or start your own company. And you know, I'm happy to, to follow up on anybody who has questions, but very highly recommend the three books that I discussed. I think they're very insightful. So thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks so much, Tom. So our final uh, talk for this section is by Ramin. Tatiani, he's going to be talking about, is there still a role to be a surgical innovator? Ramin. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. Sorry, my disclosure. It's different. It's different. So answering this needs to answer a few questions. Is that Will surgery continue to exist in the future? And uh, the answer is definitely yes. And it will even expand. So forget the prejudice of the past. It's no more a painful experience thanks to miniaturized instrument and to once forever treatment instead of having continuous treatment. And the complication rate has decreased a lot and we, a few years ago we measured it and it's uh, below some of the drugs that come to the market. So indication will grow with the aging of the population, also the safety that leads to earlier uh, treatment and the earlier you treat, the more you treat patients and there will be also new indications. So surgery will exist. So will surgery remain unchanged, so no need to innovators? And the answer is no. It will be subject to innovation because it has to incorporate new technologies and there are emerging therapies that new, need new surgeries. Gene therapy, cell therapy, reservoir, artificial retina, and others. And we still have unmet needs. Not all conditions are perfectly cured by current procedure and many untreatable conditions can still benefit from surgery. So there is a need for innovative surgeons, and the surgeon is central to the care provider, it's a central care provider, and we say in France that half of the surgery is done before, it's the indication. So the surgeon is the only one being before, during, and after the surgery, so can contribute as an innovator to all these different steps. For the indication, the innovative surgeon will uh, identify unmet medical needs, and recently we published a paper, international paper, showing that lamellar macular holes, for example, could be uh, a new indication for surgery. It has to be proved, but this is uh, a way to go. And also to clarify the perfect timing for surgery. In another uh, paper on myopia, we showed that there is a sweet spot to do surgery for myopic foveoschisis. If you do it later on, there is more complication, less benefit, so that's also some kind of innovation. When we think about surgery itself, usually we are thinking about in inventing new procedure and techniques, and of course that's important, should continue, but also the innovator can work on reporting side effects when the staining the retina come out, we showed that some of the dyes at high concentration may be dangerous, and they will even migrate to the brain and also evaluating the benefit of each step, even postoperative step. For example, posturing after the surgery is a painful experience for many patients, and showing that half of the patient could not do it alleviate a lot the treatment for them. New technologies come, the innovator can be able also to evaluate them. So being on the OR, we should always be open to innovation and be always all the sense there for serendipity, uh, many years ago, we set up, for example, a 3D digital system in our hospital. The goal at that time was only recording in 3D to make movies that are more educative. And during the surgery, I just noticed that sometimes on the screen, the image is much better than what I see on the microscope. And then I shared this with big companies, and we're happy to see that now the 3D digital microscope are here, and they will continue maybe to improve our practice. So, where is the future direction for young innovators? So surgery have to find some equilibrium and balance between two things. First, it's going to be more available, affordable, and environmentally friendly, and this needs one kind of innovation. At the same time, it's going to be more comprehensive high-tech care that will include the pre-op, intra-op, and post-op in the same 
pathway. So we will include image done on the clinic in our surgery. And we will use complex system at least to assist us to be an alarm saying that you are maybe in danger, but also to help us do better. The regulation will be a very important point, so it should be at also at a sweet spot, be safe, but not too complex because otherwise the surgery price will increase a lot, so it's not possible to have affordable surgery then. And finally, maybe the time of the solo innovator is ending, and now we are going more to have innovation in focus innovation hubs. For example, in, in Paris, we have created the French Myopia Institute, where startups, companies, uh, researchers, surgeons, and patients are all in the same space to work together to, to go to innovation. And maybe for a young innovator, it's better to integrate a, a hub of innovation where you can find a, the good place and the good people to have a very quick uh, innovation pathway. Thank you very much. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Ramin. Um, first, I just want to mention that Dave Eichenbaum wasn't able to join us um, for personal reasons. Um, and on our panel here, we're joined by uh, Nina Barakal um, from Bascom Palmer, as well as Kim Drenzer from uh, uh, Royal Oak in uh, Michigan. Um, and I just want to start off by noting that the three questions I get uh, asked all the time um, from trainees and young faculty and people interested in retina in general are, how do I get into get industry to bring me in as a consultant? How did I get uh, personally involved in startups? And then my favorite, is there a future in clinical retina or is the future better in pharma, VC, or should I start my own company? And the commonality on all of these questions is kind of like, how can I get more money and supplement <laughs> as opposed to, I have this great idea or passion to kind of go out there and do my own thing. And when I look at people who've been successful in the field, um, either in startups or in starting new, uh, new ideas, they've all had a dedication and a focus and a resiliency to get things done and put their own blinders on to actually achieve their goals and disregard you know, the naysayers that are out there. And so my first question is gonna go to um, uh, Cindy here, who's actually in our field of pediatric retina, got a, an OCT device out there that we actually can use. And why don't you tell us a little bit about what it took to get over the line? We're still not there. Yeah. Uh, so, um, so basically the issue was there we were literally dissecting drusen with OCT in our AMD patients, and then we'd go look at the infants with the indirect ophthalmoscope of the 40s, or we could say Helmholtz is 1850 practically. So here we were with ancient technology for the kids. And I was lucky Joe Isaac had an animal system. We just worked with the company and actually that was pretty easy to bring it to kids. It was the moving that forward further. Um, so that was an incubator Duke supported. Joe's company, they started making the bioptician. So, by, so they got in trouble for using my papers and saying it was clinically useful, but that helped because the FDA demanded of them that they had to respond um, to the FDA. That response actually got them 510K clearance and they had a system out in 2012. So we had access to a system. The problem is that one, 30K, it's a very slow and clunky and kind of heavy. Mm -hmm. I loved it then, but we, they've not advanced it more. And in fact, the company Leica is now busy with intraoperative OCT and doesn't really see this small part of, them, of their, you know, um, PEDS is not a big selling area. So let me, from the beginning, of the idea of OCT in pediatrics to today, how much time has been involved? Oh, it's, it was 2007, eight. So yeah. 15 years, okay. Yeah. That's dedication yeah. going out there. And now I'm working at FDA, so it's still going on. So yeah, that's dedication. But you know, you're, I'm not gonna change the world of everything, but I'm gonna change one little corner. 
Thank you. Innovation doesn't occur just in like bringing a new product. Sometimes it comes in bringing a, a new forum. Nina Barakal, you were involved and instrumental in the founding of the Vitbuckle Society. Can you tell us about how that has kind of transformed the youth of Retina and the, the new generation and what got, what was the impetus between, behind that, all of that? Well, um, you know, that, that's, a, that's a long story, but to make this um, as succinct as possible, um, you know, it was just a group of people that were young at the time and we would sit at conferences and we would always think, you know, we just want to see movies, we want to see surgery, we want people to get up there and not give me their best case scenarios, we want it to be real surgery complications. Things that would allow a young surgeon to feel um, not inadequate. So, you know, we had an idea, it was eight of us, and we pushed through, but obviously we needed industry to help us in develop our idea, and we needed people to believe that what we thought was gonna work, it, that it was gonna work. So we had a lot of support from a few companies in the beginning, and we were able to do it, and now BBS is, is a thing. And it really, um, you know, we have a great following by young surgeons. It's all surgical. Now we're incorporating some medical. We're going to have BBS silver for the aging um, retina <laughs> specialist. So, you know, we're evolving with time, but we're evolving trying to feel, fill in the gaps that, of, of the things are, that are not out there in the meetings that we go to all the time. I think you're being a little too modest there. Amongst the trainees, it's the, the most sought after meeting in the world to get to. Um, so congratulations Thank on you. that. Um, Kim, not a, many people know that you have your own company out there. Um, why don't you tell us about what it takes to keep that going and what you're doing? Uh, great, thank you. Um, so one of the things that I find really exciting about ophthalmology and retina in particular is that there are so many unanswered questions um, and we get great drugs and great products, but there's always more to do. Um, and my background was always in translational medicine. Um, my PhD was in gene therapy and retina. And that was really where I wanted things to go was to see unmet needs. Um, and so I was involved with my partners early on, um, like Darius was with telemedicine in developing that. Um, but I also was very, very interested as a pediatric retina specialist in what happens to make the eye grow the right way and what happens when it grows the wrong way. And can we harness that to uh, fix that when people get injured with ischemic retinopathies? And so. Um, Throughout my um, clinical career, I also maintained a lab and a database with, um, and built it out over, over two decades of kids with rare inherited diseases. And, um, and going back to what I think Darius's point was, is that it's a labor of love. I mean, the, the way to get involved with something is you have to have a real passion for it. You have to have a question, and you want to follow that question. In, and because we all take care of patients, you want to have a meaningful difference in their life. Um, and, I and I will tell anybody who uh, says, you know, well, I, I just want to start up a biotech. It's, it is a lot of work. It's, it's a second job, and it's a second full-time job. So you've given yourself now two full-time jobs. Um, and it's fun, and it's exciting. But I think if it's not something that you love to do, it's not the, the place you want to be. Um, but we all have opportunities to add more than just taking great care of patients. We see unmet needs. We see lots of... Um, doors open that, um, and, and it, we have a, a unique relationship with industry that they're our partners. Um, you know, a lot of times people want to villainize um, the pharmaceuticals because of the high drug prices and the marketing. But the truth is, is that they're there to make our patients' lives better, and, um, and we have great relationships with them. Um, and, and I've had a great experience going down that pathway. Great. That's, that's great. Thanks so much, Kim. I would... And the one thing I would also say about biotech is failure rates are very high. So in clinical practice, we're used to like successfully treating our patients. We give them shots. We put their retinas back on. In biotech, you know, part of, part of life is that you're trying to develop a drug or a device or whatever else. Clinical trials fail. Things go sideways. And so dealing with failure, I think, is 
it's intimidating, especially for physician personalities, because we really, really do everything we can to avoid that, obviously, in, the cl in clinical practice. Tom, just a follow-up question for you. So uh, a number of people in this room are retina specialists uh, participating in innovation. Not everyone has an MBA. How valuable do you, did you find your MBA? And as you're talking to a young retina specialist interested in industry, would you say, definitely I'd get an MBA, mentorship is enough? Kind of walk us through that a little bit in terms of your own decisions. Well, I, th I think um, uh, in being a retina specialist, you can very easily become very narrowly focused and work in your silo. And, you know, I took, did a full MBA, and there was marketing and operations management and finance and accounting and so forth. Um, and, you know, I, I am not calculating net present values and internal rate of returns or doing accounting, but at least I understand it. But, but what I think it, it did for me is it, it forced me to think a little bit more s systematically, you know, thinking about, uh, you know, for example, in, in using innovation to think about what, what you see as an unmet need as a physician, what you see as a potential asset um, as a scientist, and how do you merge that all together into a clinical trial and su sustainable business model? So I, I think it forces you to think a little bit more holistically. So I don't think you need an MBA. I do think, though, um, you know, as you sort of climb the ladder in industry, at some point it is a little bit of a moniker for you to get into a, a certain roles in industry, but, but certainly not necessary. Um, and there are a lot of examples of people who don't have MBAs that are very successful. But I think for retina specialists, it does sort of broaden your thought process. And Ramin, you tend to have a very global thought process when it comes to how we should innovate in surgery, and then also while bearing in mind, you know, how are we going to make this a profitable enterprise, both for governments and for the people who are actually innovating in this space? And can you both opine on that, as well as the potential role of surgical hubs might play in the future of uh, surgical innovation? I think um, the, the innovation has become a little bit more complex because, as uh, Tom said, we have to take into account many different things. So the good points of having all the innovators in the same place, which, which could be a big university, a big center, or a hub, is that you have everyone working on the same space, and the easy communication make everything clear. So you have an idea, you immediately have a discussion with someone, and they say, oh, this is a good idea, but it's not realistic technically to do, or there is no market for this, so you will never go far with this. And then you don't spend time in this, and you spend the time in something that is much more realistic. So I think these hubs are, uh, whatever you, the name is, the place when you have different kind of people help the innovation to, to, to be rational. Thank you. So another thing, I like industry also um, a lot, and I think it has a role for kind of giving you the discipline and the thought process of how things work and a way of doing it, but I don't really view industry as a source of innovation. I think it's a place where you can get skills and then go out and do innovation um, out of, outside of industry um, because they have their own agenda that may differ from your own. And I would like to hear both Cindy's and uh, Tom's viewpoint on that perspective because you guys have perhaps the most experience of working with larger industry. Actually, I think that innova I've seen innovation coming from industry. So we had um, an early relationship with a company where we shared ideas back and forth and then shifted to a larger company where everything was boxed and patents and all that sort. But despite that, we would see, we would still see creative things coming from the group within industry and it depends. Some companies have, you know, you have to look, do they have a research arm? What are they doing? Oftentimes you can at least re visit or talk with some of their people. So you've got some idea of what's happening there. Because if it's a company that has zero research dollars, and that's part of the answer too, then you probably won't see as much new coming out. But we have people, I'm sure this audience is full of people who go to um, advisory boards, and that's where a lot of, you know, not all of us are going to make it in our own place and license it out or something, but getting our ideas made, I've I've shared a lot of ideas, and I hope that they've helped impact people, you know, creating something different. I didn't need money for that. 
Perfect. Tom? No, I think there can be a lot of innovation from industry. So just as an example, I was at Clearside Biomedical. You know, it's true the, the, the micro-injector was already, you know, invented and so forth. But I was responsible for the preclinical pipeline, and so I would, I would have to find assets that were potential therapeutic molecules where we had freedom to operate that could be formulated in a small molecule suspension. And so we ended up doing all these preclinical um, studies on tyrosine kinase inhibitors, integrin inhibitors, plasma calicrin inhibitors, complement inhibitors, and then DNA nanoparticle uh, gene therapy. And we ended up presenting a lot of this at ARVO in the meetings. And, um, we ended up uh, publishing much of it, many in conjunction, uh, many of these papers in conjunction with people in this audience. So that was very innovative and creative. Um, similarly, at Spark Therapeutics, you know, it's true the gene therapy, you know, came from Gene Bennett's lab, but we had to innovate a whole ecosystem. We had to build the, the sort of the roads and the gas station for gene therapy because it didn't exist. So we ended up um, having to uh, uh, validate a multiluminance mobility test as a primary endpoint. Um, you know, if you have a rare genetic disease and nobody does genetic testing, you, you basically can't treat patients. So we had to implement a whole uh, genetic testing. Uh, you might, some of you might remember that. It was ID or IRD. It was 31 genes, and now it's like 260 genes. But that was from Spark. Um, we had to educate around the, the new, you know, functional endpoint, the multiluminous mobility test. So th there's a lot of innovation um, that can occur in other aspects, besides from the uh, direct therapy or the direct, you know, li in licensed um, technology. Great. And we're, uh, we're just about out of time. Just a very brief uh, question, actually, for uh, Nina and Kim. Um, so we actually have had, heard two talks. So Ramin and then Yannick earlier today talked about surgical innovation. And when I think of the two of you, two of the finest surgeons in the entire field, what's left to innovate in microvitrectomy surgery? What do you think we still, is there an area where you're like, oh, I really wish I had X, Y, or Z? And then what's, is there a market for innovation there as well in, in surgery? Well, I'll start. Um, I think there is, um, of course, a lot of um, space for innovation. I think the, the idea that we should have everything that we're doing integrated into one system would be great. Right now, you have 3D surgery with some platform, something else. So it's not really easy to use. You know, the, the technology is not super easy. So to use all those things at the same time is a challenge. Um, I think definitely for the pediatric population, we have a lot of room to grow, even from the testing machines, the cameras, the optos, you know, things that we do with them a week. I think we have a, we have a, lot, a lot to develop. Mm -hmm. Yep, and I, I would agree. I think that um, the, obviously the technology's improved um, tremendously over the past, you know, several decades. but. Um, particularly in pediatric retina, we oftentimes are just using adult tools and trying to adapt them the, as best we can. And I think that everybody who goes through a fellowship and is a good surgeon says, well, I can make all of this work. But there isn't, I, I would challenge anybody to do any case, even to a simple case, just do a macular pucker and not in the back of their mind say, I know that there's a better tool than what I'm using here or a faster way to do this or a safer way to do this or... Um, so I think that we're, we still have a lot to, to do in surgical innovation. Um, it's a lot better than it was even since I was a fellow, but, but it's, it's not nearly where, where it could be in a perfect world. Awesome. Great. Thanks so much uh, to all the panelists. And uh, we're now going to switch to section five. See you guys in the room. Yes. yes. Sounds like we're going off to prison. Do you remember when I came to your office and of course, challenged I remember. me to be the first? Yeah, you first think Karen's always going to ask. <laughs> We are asking all the faculty for session fine to join us in the podium, please.
So thank you everyone for staying into this last session, uh, very exciting on the new development in angiogenesis. Before we begin, um, on behalf of the organizing committee, we would like to apologize uh, for any inappropriate remarks that have been made uh, to the meetings. Uh, that did not reflect the opinion of any of the organizer and certainly did not reflect the opinion of Stanford University. And we apologize for that deeply uh, with that. And we hope that uh, we will continue, as uh, Dr. Cynthia Thoth had mentioned, to continue to maintain our level to the highest standard. Thank you. So we will begin uh, this session uh, with the presentation by Dr. Phil Rosenfeld, who will discuss one of the latest treatment. Phil, please take it on. Thank you, Kwan, and I appreciate the invitation to talk today and discuss this novel clinical trial design that we've developed to study intermediate AMD. And I'd also like to introduce you to an oral connection 43 inhibitor known as tenobrasat. I do have financial conflicts. I've received research support from Carl Zeiss Meditech. And Inflamex Therapeutics will be supporting this study that I'm going to share with you today. So the goals of today's presentation is to introduce the concept of persistent choroidal hypertransmission defects, to use the onset and progression of these persistent hypertransmission defects as a clinical trial endpoint to study eyes with intermediate a AMD. And I'm going to introduce Tenombrasept to you, which is an oral inhibitor of open connexin 43 hemichannels as a potential therapy to slow the progression from intermediate AMD to late AMD. So as we all know, intermediate AMD is characterized by the presence of drusen, and these drusen usually increase over time. Occasionally, they can disappear without any significant sequelae, but that's rare. Most of the time, they go on to exudative disease or geographic atrophy. And with anti-VEGF therapy, we're seeing more and more geographic atrophy. Now, historically, we use color fundus imaging to look at this progression, but we've been routinely using OCT to look at the normal disease progression in AMD. Now, we can use these dense raster scans of the macula to come up with very nice volumetric and area measurements by using an RP to Brooks membrane seg segmentation. And these area me measurements have been validated against color images. And we also use the same raster scan pattern to look at geographic atrophy. The geographic atrophy, when we look at a sub-RP slab from 64 to 400 microns under the RP, gives us these areas that are bright. And they're bright because where you have attenuation or loss of the RP, you get hypertransmission into the choroid, which allows you to visualize the atrophy very, very nice, nicely. So what are the smallest lesions that progressed the geographic atrophy. So I want to thank Robin Geimer. We performed this three-year natural history study where we looked at intermediate AMD and we found these hypertransmission defects. And when you look at individual B scans at each of these hypertransmission defects, they're associated with this choroidal hypertransmission. And we found then when they reached the greatest linear dimension of 250 microns, either horizontal, vertical, diagonal, it doesn't matter, they persisted, and this work has been validated by Vasada's group with an independent data set. So do they progress the geographic atrophy? And the answer is yes. Once they persist, they progress. And can they be used as a clinical trial endpoint? So here's the normal disease progression that we see in intermediate AMD. We have a Drusen vol volume without any hypertransmission defects, and you can see them on the B scan there. As the Drusen grow, before they collapse, they actually form the hypertransmission defects. And the Drusen then continues to collapse, more hypertransmission defects form, and they grow and they coalesce and they form typical geographic atrophy. So to use these persistent hypertransmission defects as a clinical trial endpoint, they have to be absent in intermediate AMD by definition, precursor to typical GA. When detected, they persist by definition, easily and reproducibly detected and measured. We've shown that growth rate can be measured and the growth rate is reproducible. So here's the clinical trial design. You start with high risk Drusen eyes. We've calculated that this means a, a volume of 0 0.2 millimeters cubed in the central macula, and then there's no evidence of persistent hypertransmission defects. We randomize 100 eyes into each treatment group, and that assures that we will get the appropriate number after one year of hypertransmission defects, about 50 eyes, 
And the possible treatment effects are to prevent the onset of these defects and the growth of these defects. So by two years, the primary endpoint is the overall growth rate of these hypertransmission defects. The progression of the hypertransmission defect is associated with the appearance and the growth. And this clinical trial design has been accepted by the FDA mm. for an intermediate AMD study. And all this work can be found in our AJO paper that came out last month. So what's the ideal treatment for intermediate AMD? I think we can all agree we don't need any more intravitreal injection. And we'd like a treatment that could reach both eyes since it's usually a bilateral disease at this stage. Treatment needs to be safe, obviously. And the treatment we would like to preserve or improve visual function or anatomy. So let me introduce you to Tenobrasat. It was developed 25 years ago by Smith Klein Beecham as a treatment for migraines and used in over 1,500 patients. It's an oral medication, never FDA approved, crosses the blood, brain, and blood retinal barrier. And the most common treatment related adverse events are transient and their headache, dizziness, and GI distress. And it inhibits pathologically open connexin 43 hemichannels. What are connexin 43 hemichannels? Well, they come together to form gap junk junctions, and normally they exist independently in a closed form, but they can be pathologically open. And when they're open in the undocked mode, they actually release intracellular ATP into the extracellular space. And increased extracellular ATP affects both the releasing cell and the neighboring cell. They actually cause activation of the intracellular inflammasome, and extracellular ATP and inflammasome activation results in a cytokine storm. And this is a vicious cycle where more ATP gets released, more um, inflammasomes are ac activated. So the idea is you have closed hemichannels, they get open through oxidative stress, inflammation, ischemia, hypoxia, and tenomercept closes these hemichannels. So here's the clinical trial design. We enroll patients with intermediate AMD with the high-risk Drusen volume. We randomize them to 40, 80 milligrams tenobrasep versus placebo, and then we follow them every three months. The endpoint is at two years, and we have a lot of secondary endpoints that we're interested in studying, including the onset of exudation. Mm -hmm. So persistent choroidal hypertransmission defects precede the formation of ge geographic atrophy. The onset and progression can be used as a clinical trial endpoint and tenombrasap is an oral inhibitor of these open connexin 43 hemichannels and a potential therapy to slow the progression from intermediate AMD to geographic atrophy. Thank you for your attention. And now I would like to introduce the co-moderator of the session, uh, Dr. Robert Bissico, uh, professor of ophthalmology at UCSF, who will introduce our next speaker, Bob. Dave Boyer will give us the next talk, which will be non-anti-VEGF strategies, promise or bust. Thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me to be here today. These are my financial disclosures. There are a number of other pathways beside the VEGF pathway. We're all familiar with VEGF A, uh, VEGF A and VEGF B, but there's VEGF C, there's integrins, there's ANG2 uh, inhibitors, there's PDGF, and other things. Integrin peptides um, do treat neovascular disease. Integrin, the alpha-5 beta-3, has been observed in CNV and associated with wet AMD, alpha-V uh, beta-3 and alpha-B uh, alpha beta-5 has also been observed with PDR. And there are a number of different companies that are looking at integrins as they're long-acting, and they do reduce the uh, progression of neovascularization. They target a multiple uh, pathways, and uh, we really know that there is probably necessary to reduce progression. TKIs, you've heard a lot about this today, and, and if you were there earlier for the um, I Accelerator meeting, and you're gonna hear a lot about it at our meeting coming up. There's a number of TKIs that are in trial at this point. TKIs are very effective. They are unfortunately um, take a while to get to work. So you need some type of anti-VEGF to get rid of the VEGF. These go intercellularly. And once they're intercellularly, they do react with all different uh, receptors. So there are a lot of TKI receptors. You have the VEGF R1, 2, uh, VEGF3, 
And you also have uh, uh, placental growth factors and other factors. There's no real consensus at this point which one's better, but the good thing, these are small molecules that can last a long time. So you're looking at six to nine months and sometimes even one year of prolonged treatment. ICON-1 is a tissue factor, and tissue factor is overexpressed in CNV vessels and in the vitreous of wet AMD patients. Um, it drives inflammation angiogenesis, and inhibiting tissue factor inhibits angiogenesis, inhibits inflammation, and may uh, actually reduce the size of the CNV. So this is another uh, factor that has been tested and has shown some promise and may go forward in the future. Opthea or OPT302 is an inhibitor of VEGF C and D. We know that you can inhibit VEGF uh, R1, VEGF R2, but C is upregulated in patients who receive anti VEGF therapy. And it may be that this upregulation of VEGF um, C may actually be part of the reason that we see some breakthrough later uh, when we're treating our patients on a chronic basis, that some of our patients actually get a tachyphylaxis. In addition, when combined with an anti-VEGF, the combination of OPT302 showed a definite improvement overall in the visual acuity. So the combination of these two drugs together is very, very important. And we do have gene therapy that's looking at a combination in uh, D4150, where they're looking at a combination of an anti-VEGF plus um, the VEGF-C inhibition. Uh, you UBX um, has a treatment for ses senescent cells. Most of us in the audience probably don't know what a senescent cell is. It's actually a cell that is not dividing. It's a sick cell. And what does that do? Well, that cell actually liberates growth factors, prophybotic factors, and inflammatory factors. So by eliminating the senescent cells, you are actually getting an anti-inflammatory response and this has been shown to actually improve vision overall. Last, I'm going to talk about CD59 or HMR59. It's reduced on the RPE cells of AMD patients. We know that C3 and C5, which have been shown to be helpful in the treatment for geographic atrophy, are really, really trying to block the MAC complex. Well, CD59 blocks the MAC complex. It's a natural membrane-bound protein that blocks the MAC complex. CD59 is decreased in patients with wet macular degeneration and is, uh, can be increased by this gene therapy. And uh, has, this has been shown to work both for dry as well as wet macular degeneration. The big question is, are these other non-VEGF treatments of value? So far, anti-VEGF is still the treatment of choice. TKIs offer the ability to reduce treatment burden but are maintenance drugs. Integrins can be additive, also promising for a long treatment interval. CD59 is still in the complement system and therefore may have some limit, limited efficacy. Blocking VEGF C and D may reduce breakthroughs. And removal of senescent cells reduces inflammation and may improve outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, next, we will have uh, Dr. Leila Vasovic from Duke University who will be talking about the genes uh, therapy solution. Thank you, Kwan. Thank you to the rest of the organizing committee. It's true pleasure to, true pleasure here, to be here with you all today. These are my disclosures, and I do the consult, and I'm an investigator for several gene therapy companies, including Regenix Bio. We all were super excited about the first FDA approval, first in human gene therapy, and that was a for, um, AAV vector to treat RP65. Since then, we've seen development of several gene therapy um, agents, and there has been really explosion, true explosion of trials in IRDs and even common retinal diseases. And these common retinal diseases are truly attacking exudative AMD, atrophic AMD, what we just heard a little bit, and diabetic retinopathy. There's several ways you can deliver gene therapy uh, in the eye. Intravitreal approach, supracortical approach, or subretinal uh, via pars plana uh, um, approach. So really, all of these are viable options that are currently being studied. Let's cover some of them. So intravitreal, uh, we would um, be very commonly used technique that we all are very familiar with, but unfortunately comes with a risk of inflammation and immune response there. And also, really, are you delivering the product where it's needed? 
Subretinal delivery is really the longest study thus far, the gold standard, so to speak, um, and you're delivering the product exactly when it's needed in subretinal space. But it is a surgical approach. It delivers a drug in the operating to the patient. And then supracortal approach, there is a in-office approach to this. Technically, it would be easy, uh, widely available, and it's definitely a novel approach that uh, we are currently studying, and hopefully we'll have more data on that in the future. I'm going to be, in, because of the time constraints, I'm going to be pr primarily covering the RGX314 product and pr primarily subretinal delivery as well as supracortal delivery for neovascular AMD. As I mentioned, there are several trials with this um, product, but I will cover neovascular AMD and then really mention briefly atmosphere and scent, and then Aviate is the supracortal approach in office. So what are some of the... Um, design of the trial and what are the current um, results from it. So as I mentioned, the subretinal approach um, surgically is really the longest studied and really we have the longest follow-up. This was a phase one, two A study that was a dose escalating enrolling patients um, in five cohorts and really looking at the outcome at six um, months to understand what the safety and efficacy was. And then later on looking at a protein production, best correctable jocularly and central retinal thickness. And really what we learned from the study, even ongoing currently, and these are actually actually data from two years, we know it's well tolerated across all doses. We know that we're seeing very good protein production even at two years, and you'll, no you'll notice it's a dose-dependent effect. And you'll notice also that best corrective visual acuity in higher doses is stable to maintain. These patients are now being followed in extension follow-up um, period up to five years, and they're really followed on um, six months and yearly basis with really the routine data being collected. And thus far, in interim safety continues to be really well tolerated. No major SAEs that are drug related. There was a patient cohort five, the highest cohort who had RP changes in the macula. Uh, the, uh, the procedure since then has been adapted to deliver drug inferiorly, and that patient did have visual acuity loss um, as part of the trial. The best corrective visual acuity in the higher cohorts continues to be stable um, to improved. You'll notice there, um, patients are definitely having significant um, best correctable visual acuity is stable, but also based on the treatment, the retreatment criteria, you'll notice that really some patients do not require an injection, single injection after initial treatment. So I think that's quite impressive. And you'll notice the higher dose, doses um, have a really um, significant reduction in terms of annualized injection rate and quite a drop in number of injections needed over time. So really the long-term follow-up has really informed us and fueled us to start of the two pivotal trials, the atmosphere and scent. These are currently enrolling and are really the biggest surgical trials out there in gene therapy, planning to involve, include 1,200 patients nationally and internationally. I'm going to briefly mention the supracortal approach. It's a, a brand new technique for all of us, but one that's actually currently used for some of the other therapies that are approved. Um, it is um, really a early study looking at phase two study, looking at safety and efficacy, really your typical AMD patients. This is a dose escalating treatment where it's understanding what, um, what exactly doses um, to be implemented in the future, what are the safety associated with that? And you'll notice that it's really quite safe. There are patients with some episcleritis um, that are especially in higher cohorts that is very much um, self-treated or topical um, such. Best corrective visual acuity is stable to improved as well as central retinal thickness and significant reduction in need of recurrent therapy um, based on this. So really the learnings thus far have been that we're continuing to increase the dose, we're keeping the dose three, but including pot potentially prophylactic therapy with steroids and understanding how potentially that will help us uh, with this, um, this cohort. So overall, um, safety continues to be well tolerated thus far in the follow-up. You'll notice there's significant reduction in need of retreatment as well as overall um, um, follow-up rate. So in summary, I think gene therapy is definitely happening now in terms of what's approved out there. I think the next generation gene therapy will be very much hopefully approved for common retinal diseases where we're generating ocular biofactory. And I think the programs that I talked to you today about are quite promising and, and we'll see what the future holds for them. Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Dr. Wiley Chambers. He's going to speak about clinical trial design for exudative diseases. Thank you very much to, to the organizers. Um, I'm going to try giving this talk without slides. 
I gave the slide, I gave the talk once before with slides. It had the regulatory language that incorporates this, and I think I put most people to sleep. Hmm. <laughs> so I'm gonna try it a different way. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, first, my conflicts of interest, I have none. I'm prohibited by law from having any, so I don't. <laughs> um, and these are my comments, not necessarily those of the Food and Drug Administration. I'm required to say that. Haven't quite figured out if I don't talk for the FDA about ophthalmology clinical trial design, who does, but I haven't been able to get an answer out of the agency on, on that. So requirements legally for the Food and Drug Administration to approve a product are that the safety and efficacy be demonstrated by adequate and well-controlled trials. And that's the way it's written, is adequate and well-controlled trials. And there is then a portion of the, of the regulations that define what an adequate and well-controlled trial is. Four of them, I think, are very straightforward. Nobody would particularly question what they are. One is a clear statement of objectives. You better know what you're looking for. The second is that the analysis at the end has to be accurate. Again, straightforward. Don't think you find very many trials that don't have that. The third is the selection of patients has to assure that they have the disease. Again, you have inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria. You pick out people that have whatever the disease or condition is that you're trying to study. So far, so good. The fourth is the assessment method has to be well-defined and reliable. What does that mean? Well, it means you need to describe what it is you're looking for. And for the purposes of the Food and Drug Administration, you need to demonstrate why is that a benefit to the patient. The so what test hmm. that I typically talk about. Why does a patient care? How are you able to evaluate the benefits versus the risks if you don't have some benefit to the patient? I don't know how to go and do that. So we look for endpoints that are of benefit to the patient. Most of the time, that's not a finding on a particular scan. Whether the scan looks one way or another, if the patient doesn't see any different, the patient doesn't care. And it's very difficult to balance any kind of adverse event against something that hasn't demonstrated benefits. And if I leave you with nothing else, all drugs that work have adverse events and risks. I'm unaware of anything that does something that doesn't also potentially do something bad. <coughs> Hopefully the benefits are better than the, than the risks, but that's what trials go and figure out. The fifth is the study design permits a valid comparison. And then the regulation gives different examples of what kind of trial design that would be. It can be a placebo controlled. It can be a dose comparison controlled. It can be an active controlled. Any of those are perfectly valid. Generally, placebo controls are superiority trials. Dose comparisons are superiority control, or superiority designs. You're trying to find out which dose is better than the other dose. An active comparison is inherently a non-inferiority trial. You are showing you are no worse than something that already has shown its benefits outweigh the risks. In order to do a non-inferiority trial, you have to have a non-inferiority margin. The way a non-inferiority margin is established is a prior placebo-controlled trial. If you don't have that, or the trials that were done with the placebo aren't consistent, you don't have a non-inferiority margin, and so you can't do a non-inferiority trial. Sixth criteria is to assign patients to minimize bias. That's randomization. That's straightforward. And the last is that you have to minimize bias on the part of subjects, observers, and analysts. Typically done by masking, but it means you need to do everything you can to minimize bias. So the last three things that I mentioned are all referencing bias. One of the things we have now started going in the opposite direction on that we had allowed before was sham treatments. And we are starting to push back on any sham treatments because they don't minimize bias. Patients can tell 
frequently what they got if they, if they are in a sham group. And so to minimize bias, we've been doing, doing away with any kind of sham price. And I'll be, and I'm happy to answer questions when we get to there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chambers. Uh, we are now begin our panel discussion on the development of that, so Bob and I will uh, lead the section with that. Uh, before we begin, uh, we would like to introduce the additional panelists. In addition to the distinguished speaker that you have seen, I would like to introduce, we'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Christy Kay, who is one of the top leader retina specialists, especially in the field of gene therapy from Florida. Uh, next, uh, we also have uh, some colleagues who are from industry, uh, Dr. Aaron Henry, who is currently the Vice President for uh, Product Strategy and uh, Innovation at Iverick Bio. And, and then uh, we also have Dr. Riyad Shiraf, who is currently the uh, Chief Executive Officer at Oculus. Uh, on there that you've heard earlier today that some of the topical medications come from Oculus there. So with that, uh, let's begin the, um, the, uh, some of the discussion question here. And certainly we welcome anyone to, uh, to uh, come up to the uh, microphone and ask the questions. Uh, I guess we can start with the first question here. Uh, Dr. Chamber, you just discussed about uh, shame treatment and things. So in the past, we have discussed it as a shame. So we uh, very much, just, for example, when we do intravitreal injection, we just very much just prep the patient and then will not go in. But now, is there a push for actual intravitreal injection of a, for example, balanced hosting in there? Is that what you mean when you say that we really want to have a good shame? So as I mentioned, there are three possibilities. One is placebo, which would be a injection of nothing. Um, there are potential risks with an, with an injection, intravitreal injection. They are not very high. I would argue they're probably less than uh, giving the test product that you don't know anything about. So the first 100 patients or so that you give the test product, you haven't figured out exactly what it does. We know what a vehicle control trial, or what a vehicle does, sailing does. Um, so the risks really aren't any greater than what you're already doing. Dose comparison is always the other alternative. So you, since you haven't figured out exactly what the best dose is, then giving another dose and figuring out which is the better dose is always one of those options, and you show that one dose is better than another. So you have an option to, to use. This is great. Uh, any question, comment from the audience, from any of our panelists? Anything would like to be clarified? Uh, Dr. Judy Kim. Was designing protocol N uh, using saline versus anti-VEGF into the eye, we decided not to inject saline into the eye uh, because of potential safety reasons, because there is a risk of endophthalmitis even when you are injecting saline into the eye. And um, we also did a, a, a survey asking um, our subjects from prior studies from DRCRNet uh, asking, do, do you know whether you got sham or um, actual injection? And 90% of those who were in the sham group thought they were getting an injection. So based on that and um, uh, others, we decided not to use active injection for the control group. Um, do you have data as to, you said you know, many patients know that they're getting sham. Do you have uh, data for that? And do you feel that by Met, uh, uh, requiring the, the control arm to get actual injection, is it going to be harder for clinical trials to enroll patients and it might become more difficult to carry out these research? So you only quoted part of what was in this study. There are several other parts of the study that significantly suggest that patients could tell depending on what their past history was. I don't buy the argument that 90% of the people can't tell. It's not consistent with what we've seen. It's not consistent with the rest of that article. That said, 
why would you not give a different dose, a different concentration? It's not been figured out that this is the, the correct dose. Most of the trials may be due in order of magnitude differences. They clearly have not identified what the best dose is for the patients. That still offers a potential benefit and potentially helps out everybody in the future by figuring out a better dose. So going forward, it's not no um, drug injection, but uh, different dose. That's what you're I, I suggested by regulation, there are three different op opportunities. One is, not, is, is nothing. That's just one possibility. Mm -hmm. Another is a different dose. The third is still an active for when there is a non-inferiority margin. In many cases where companies are trying to figure out, can I give this less frequently, they're not trying to be the same. If they wanted to be the same, they would, could compare it in the same frequency, and then you can do a non-inferiority trial by giving, say, each thing Q8 or um, Q4. If the goal is to extend the, the duration, then you should show there's a reason for extending the duration. That's superiority. Thank you. Can I ask a follow-up question? Sure, go ahead, Christine, go ahead. On the, on the, um, since we're on the sham control discussion, just it, it kind of further complicates the question if we start talking about subretinal gene therapy trials, which we were mentioning the Regenex Bio trial and there are a number of different IRD trials that are delivering subretinally, um, the question of dose. And so sometimes it puts um, uh, development programs in, in a little bit of a bind trying to come up with safe and of potentially effective doses from CMC manufacturing constraints with you know half a log in between doses to be able to create these doses from a CMC standpoint and then there may not be two or three doses that you know that we think from our dose escalation are safe and effective to be able to really compare that um, so you know one option would be maybe doing a volume comparison for subretinal instead of a you know, vector genome concentration comparison. I, I, I don't think that you're suggesting that we should do a vitrectamine, a subretinal injection of BSS. So I just wanted to confirm that. That would be very, probably high risk for the patient. Um, but just to confirm, what, how would this argument uh, work for subretinal gene therapy? Yeah. I am not suggesting a subretinal um, saline Good. injection. Okay. However, the dose escalation that I suspect you are suggesting is three patients tested in an open label fashion with three or, or more doses escalating. That is not a way to determine efficacy. That is an initial safety, whether you had a major safety problem, which normally gets identified in the first three patients of a particular concentration. That does not establish by any means what the correct efficacy is. If you're comparing three, the response of three patients to another and saying this is the best dose, I think I made my point that you're not doing adequate dose response. Great. I mean, like we discussed, I just wanted to indicate to everyone that we are actually incredibly uh, fortunate and beneficial to have uh, in the room with us right now the third chamber of the eyes who's sitting with us and address all the questions. So it's actually very great for all of us in this, this because Dr. Chamber has been very kind in, in shares his opinion here. Uh, so please can you to ask questions. Bob, you have any other questions? Go ahead. Yes, I just wanted to uh, switch gears a little bit and, and talk to Dr. Rosenfeld. Uh, I, I wasn't previously familiar with this finding of these uh, persistent hypertransmission defects, and they very intrigued by the idea of these as a very early marker to moving to advanced AMD. So I, I want to ask Phil, is this something that's only detected on ONFOS OCT, and is it, is, how is it different than just small geographic atrophy? So there's been a great deal of interest in trying to identify biomarkers that precede the onset of geographic atrophy. The CAM group, classification of atrophy meeting, has spent a lot of time investigating different parameters. And they came up with the IRORA, CRORA format, which many of you have heard, but those were dependent on individual B scans. Recent work that we performed in collaboration with Vasada and from our own group in collaboration with the Moran Eye Center in Tel Aviv, um, in Utah and a center in Tel Aviv, we've been able to show that this B-scan definition of IRORA and CRORA is really deficient because AMD is not a B-scan disease. It's a volumetric disease. 
and you need to either perform B scans that are very closely spaced and look at neighboring B scans, or you need to look at this on FOSS strategy. Because in these papers that are coming out, about 50% of IROR is already CROR if you look at neighboring B scans. So by looking at the on FOSS image using Heidelberg or Cirrus or Plex, Plex Elite, you can identify these early hypertransmission defects that once they reach that 250, they persist and eventually go on to what you would consider typical geographic atrophy. So it really requires dense volumetric B scans, whatever device you want to use, and then you need to look at them either very carefully, B scan by B scan, or just use the on FOSS strategy to identify them. Thank you. Yes, Ursula, please. Phil, I'm just wondering whether by going back to that window defect in the RPE, we are reproducing what FAF did and we are ignoring all the neurosensory preceding events that define geographic atrophy as a neurodegenerative disease. And in the Pinnacle study, which is a multi-center prospective trial, we look on the first focal events before GA happens. And what we see is already 18 months before the first clinical sign becomes visible that the ONL is thinning focally significantly. Then the photoreceptors disappear. And then six months later, the RPE develops this window. So I wonder whether we shouldn't be more neurosensory and less window defect. And, and also about the scan pattern why not use the best precision imaging if we want to have the best precision early diagnosis? I agree with everything Sorry. you've said, Ursula. Fabulous. Thank you so much. And I think <laughs> your data shows beautifully the power of on FOSS imaging. But the key is highly dense volumetric scans to pick up the earliest manifestation of the hypertransmission defect. And what's so useful in these dense scans is we can also look at the EZ zone, the outer retinal thick thickness. We can identify hyperpigmentation. We can identify the early calcification of Drusen. So by performing dense volumetric scans, we can see all the changes that you highlighted in your talk as precursors to the more typical atrophy. So I think the future is very dense scanning and a number of different algorithms to look at photoreceptors, hypertransmission, RPA, attenuation, and these other manifestations of AMD. Because as you know, AMD is not a monolithic disease. There are many different types of AMD. We're looking at one kind that's these large drusen going to atrophy. But there's also the reticular pseudodrusen and other manifestations that precede the formation of atrophy. All that can be included once you do these very dense volumetric scans. And I should add that microperimetry is also being done in conjunction, particularly with the CAM CAM group. And we've been able to show that once these hypertransmission defects form, that threshold sensitivity drops too. So they go hand in hand. Thank you, Phil. So, uh, I'm going back looking at some of the questions being sent to us. So I'm now going back to uh, Trout is I also too. So the next question again go to Dr. Chamber and things. So this had to do with endpoints. And uh, in ophthalmology, so we know that uh, for other field ophthalmology, for example, in glaucoma, the endpoint is pressure. Uh, for example, but certainly in retina, for AMD and for DME, thus for nevascular AMD and DME, so far has been visual acuity. So first question is, the FDA has specified a change of at least 15 letters in there. So we want to ask you, why 15 letters? Because in uh, the clinical thing, we sometimes we believe, we do see that five letter or 10 letter seem to be appropriate. Why it's just about 15 letters? And then second, uh, certainly uh, over the past decade, we have seen many different end, uh, endpoints that we as clinician scientists use at clinic, for example, in thickness, central subfield thickness. So can you share with us again your point of view of why we could not, for example, consider central subfield thickness and OCT as part of our clinical trial uh, for AMD, univascular AMD or DME, for example. So I'll take the second question first. We don't consider 
uh, retinal thickness to be a clinically significant endpoint that the patient um, that, that is correlated with visual acuity uh, or any kind of other visual function. If you look at thin retinas, you call them macular degeneration. If you look at thick retinas, you call it macular edema. There have been multiple different looks at whether changing the thickness is correlated with any type of visual function, and there have not been correlations. As for the first question, why do we take 15 letters? We take 15 letters because we frequently see 15 letter or less changes in trials that have no impact on visual acuity. We routinely measure visual acuity in everything we do. We have studies in bacterial conjunctivitis, blepharitis, um, IOP lowering, things that you would not expect in a short period of time to affect visual acuity changes, and we see 15-letter changes on a regular basis. We consequently, don't accept anything that's less than 15 letters as being clinically significant um, as far as being a benefit to a patient. Uh, common thoughts from our colleagues? Go ahead. You can come to the uh, microphone, Jason. Uh, thank you for the interesting discussion. I wanted to segue on uh, what Dr. Nguyen mentioned. So we do know that for BCAVAs, 15 letters that are considered clinically significant. How do we determine for all those new functional endpoints, uh, microperimetry, dark adaptation, contrast, low luminance, what is clinically significant? Thank you. Uh, we have defined, in most cases, what is clinically significant for each of the different parameters. Um, I would need a list and you need to specify the particular test for me to tell you what that was all the way through, but from a clinical development perspective, people propose clinical trials and we'll make comments on whether we think it's clinically relevant or not. Um, things like visual acute, uh, visual fun uh, good, visual fields <laughs> or microperimetry we typically say you need to pre-identify an area, and that area can va vary from patient to patient, uh, particularly for things like um, some type of geographic atrophy or some type of other macular change. Pick an area ahead of time, show that the mean of that, of that area is different by seven decibels. Is seven decibels a high number as far as change? Yes. Um, would do we think that anybody would question if you change seven decibels that that won't be clinically significant? No. Maybe some, maybe one person in the room might. But we think it's a, it's a legitimate starting point. Ultimately, we look at the benefits versus the risks of any particular product. We have just have put out benchmarks that we think everybody would agree to, and we may ultimately accept something less depending on once we know what the risks are. But to tell, tell you what is definitely clinically significant, before the trial is ever run, I'm going to set a relatively high threshold. And so most of those thresholds are relatively high, knowing that we may reevaluate that once we see the full clinical trial results. Can I ask a quick follow-up on the BCVA? I live in a world of really low vision patients as an IRD specialist, so we don't always have ETDRS as an option. So uh, how does the FDA currently feel about low vision patients, either BRVT or Freiburg, um, Logmar visual acuity calculation patients uh, regarding a BCVA outcome that would be approvable? So we're willing to look at different potential ways of measuring visual acuity. The reliability of things like Freiburg are not um, as good as the EDTRS methodology. That said, there are assignments that have been made for those visual acuities. The same 0.3 logmore probably doesn't apply in the um, higher levels. I'm not questioning that hand motion and um, light perception are the same thing. Do we think they're clearly different? Are they different by 0.3 logmar? Maybe, maybe not. Uh, um, we use light perception. We use light perception with projection. But that's really a patient just saying yes or no to what's there. And even, even when we do hand motion, if you're good, you maybe do 
check and see if the hand motion is vertical versus horizontal versus diagonal, but most people don't even do that. They just say, did you see my hand moving? And accept that as an answer. We haven't really defined a lot of that. So I suspect we will accept particular proposed scales. I'm just not sure how much of a change we're going to say is clinically significant. We probably won't say one step on a, on a whatever scale you give is being clinically significant. There's just too much variability on, on changing one step. But if you can define a scale and then say something is two or three steps on that scale, we're likely to accept it. Yes. Uh, uh, a quick question. Um, uh, Dr. Chambers, I agree that seven decibels is, um, is certainly going to be meaningful, but you have to predefine those, and, and that's where I have a little bit of a problem. You know, if you have an overall improvement in the visual field of microperimetry visual field, um, why do you think that we have to pre-specify pre where those points will? Because we really don't know. But if the person's getting an overall improvement, let's say for geographic atrophy, for example, and they're getting an overall improvement in their microperimetry afterwards or whatever condition you're finding, what, what is the purpose of pre-specifying? Yeah, it's a multiplicity issue. It's if you are looking at 64 points and you find a point that changes by seven decibels out of 64, that's not... I, I agree, but if you find uh, your 64 points and you find that 50 of them improve or 45 of them improve, wouldn't that be something that you would take in consideration? Because it's hard, uh, you know, AI may help us to decide where these areas may improve, but it's difficult to know ahead of time exactly where those areas of improvement will occur. Yeah. So uh, as I mentioned, this is a pre-specification before we've seen the results of the a particular trial. So in most cases, if you're not sure of the particular area, we expect you probably pick a bigger area than, you know, that encompasses everything with where you think it's going to work. Um, and then we will look at the results. And unquestionably, we'll take seven decibels. But as I said, we may take something smaller once we see the full study results. Thank you. Just one more follow-up question. Sure, go ahead, later. Um, Dr. Chambers, like we talked about acuity, we talked about central retinal thickness. How about treatment burden for like diseases? Would you consider a reduction or would FDA consider a reduction of treatment burden as a endpoint in clinical trial? So on its surface, you're saying we should call a benefit to the patient not taking something that's been shown to be safe and efficacious. When we approve a product, we say that product is safe and efficacious, and you want me to count less taking of something that's safe and efficacious as being a benefit. We generally don't do that. On the other hand, if you think there is a, the burden will result in less adverse events, we say measure the adverse events. If truly not having as many treatments results in less adverse events, then that's the measure you use and say, okay, this is a benefit because the patient had less adverse events. So it's not that there's not a way of counting it, it's count it what was important to the patient, meaning less adverse events. Thank you. We have just a few more questions for you, Dr. Vendor. Uh, one question has to do with study durations. And in general, in the past, for a trial with neovascular AMD, for example, it's usually at 12 months' time. Recently, it's been proposed to decrease it down to less than 12 months. What about diabetic macular edema, for example? Uh, can we consider decrease that, or you still insist that should be a 12-month study for the efficacy part? So we started with diabetic all diabetic trials are being three years. We did that because the DCCT trial showed that what you find early on with control of diabetes is not the answer you'll get after three years. For those people that are not aware of the DCCT trial, DCCT trial was a intensive insulin therapy versus non-intensive insulin therapy. And those people that are on intensive insulin therapy did worse during the first three years, and the curves came back together at three years. And after three years, being on the intensive was the better treatment um, regimen. 
as we looked at further data, as people did different trials, we recognized that that phenomena only applied when the hemoglobin A1C was being affected. If you did not affect the hemoglobin A1C, you did not have that phenomena occurring. And it does repeatedly occur anytime you affect the hemoglobin A1C quickly. So at that point, we reduced the trial design time to one year. We continue to go and follow to see how predictive it is. We originally had a one-year time point for AMD trials. And as we looked, had multiple clinical trials and looked through, we found we were always able to predict at nine months what happened after nine months in an AMD trial. So we changed the time of endpoint to nine months. We have not found that to be the case for DME or diabetic retinopathy, that a nine-month time or a six-month time is always predictive of what happens later on. So we have not changed that time point. With the exception of the gene therapy, um, gene therapy is still, um, the Center for Biologics is still insisting on at least one-year endpoints for those trials. So the nine months doesn't apply to gene therapy. Great, thank you. Uh, one question, go ahead, please. Speaking then of gene therapy, Dr. Chambers, uh, you issued a draft guidance for commentary earlier in the year. When will you have had, when were you planning on issuing the final guidance document? Because although it gave a lot of input and perspective on what the agency was looking, didn't really tailor towards drugs that are being developed, new modality drugs that are being developed for what AMD. The agency, certainly the Center for Drugs, has a long, prolonged pathway to getting guidance documents out. Um, internally, we wrote up about 31 draft guidance documents 20 plus years ago. Internally, that's what we follow, but we've tried, as we've tried to get them out of the agency, we've been unable to. What happens is we, they are circulated among staff in the Center for Drugs, and every, anybody that wants to comment on it is free to comment on it, including people who I don't believe even remember that the, eye, that the people have two eyes. Um, it took several years to get that to a draft guidance document. Um, I don't know at what point we're going to be able to respond to the various comments that were done try and do the dry eye one first, because that, that went out as a draft guidance document first, and that hasn't been finalized either. Um, I don't know when either one will become finalized or when any of the others will go out. Do you have any perspective on some of the specifics or some of the important points that you might be considering based on the feedback you receive from industry? Yes. Um, For new modalities. I'm actually not permitted to go and comment on pre-decisional things that the agency is supposedly acting on. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Now, that, um, when the question was sent here, it's a, a little bit uh, retrospective here. So a few years ago, uh, the FDA and also the NEI at that time held a workshop, held a workshop to talk about endpoint in geographic atrophy. And at that time, uh, it was advised that we look at the change in the lesions you have mentioned that we, in any trial, we should also look, ask the question, so what for the patient, and what are some of the functional benefits? Now, looking back, would you have advised us that if even for any of those trials, in addition to the anatomic changes, the change in lesion, there should also be accompanied by a change in functional endpoint in order to make whatever drug compound that is uh, beneficial and directly benefit to the patient? So the two products that are approved for treatment of geographic atrophy are based on a anatomical changing of the slope of photoreceptor loss. Um, I, and I have not yet heard anybody try to argue that if you uh, lose photoreceptors, you can still see from that particular location. So we think it's clinically relevant to have uh, prevented the loss of photoreceptors. Then we get into what is the size, how many photoreceptors, are we willing to approve something based on preventing one photoreceptor loss? Probably not. There's clearly over um, redundancy in the system that 
one photoreceptor patient's never gonna, gonna lose. Minimum threshold is probably, for a clinically relevant finding, is probably something closer to the size of a natural blind spot. That said, since we know that photoreceptor loss is a bad thing, if patients are likely to ultimately have the size of a blind spot loss, we think that's potentially the clinically relevant finding. So we've looked for a change in the slope that is diverging. So it's not at any point becoming parallel, but it's continuing to diverge. And if it continues to diverge, we believe you, we will ultimately have a clinically significant amount. That's the finding that we then compared to the adverse events that were seen with the two geographic atrophy products in deciding that the benefits outweighed the risk. You can argue that that's is such a small difference that the adverse events were or were not um, bad enough or good enough to allow approval. That's a judgment decision. But that's what we ended up making. Great. Thank you. Now, I'd like to see some comments here from our two colleagues from industry in the panel, uh, Aaron and, and Riyadh. Having heard about this like this, do you have any comments or thoughts on what you have heard so far in the discussion? I mean, you're behind the scene on the other side of the, of the aisle here. So, Erin, and then react. what are your thoughts on some of the comments here? Well, I appreciate the open discussion and dialogue and the inherent challenges. Um, I'm very intrigued by the work that Phil's doing on, I think many of us would like to figure out pathways to going earlier and preventing the frank geographic atrophy um, and late stage AMD that you know so much of us are now in the treatment realm uh, trying to, to slow down and prevent. Um, do you have any thoughts on what Phil's proposed and is that meaningful if we know something like a persistent hypertransmission defect is going to go on to establish atrophy? Is that potentially a path forward? So presently, under the present scheme, to the extent that that defect represents a loss of photoreceptors, it's already covered by what we're saying because you are showing a increase in photoreceptor loss and that meets the criteria that I said we think is clinically significant. And Riyadh? I will be actually very short. I I uh, appreciate all the presentations, actually, actually very good presentations, very good innovation. What is also reassuring is to see the consistency of FDA. So thank you. That's great. Thank you. That's great. Uh, OK, and now you have the questions. Go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Chambers. I just had one more follow-up question. Um, so ocular therapeutics received an SPA yesterday. Just had to clarify something on that. So if a patient is to get rescued without losing 15 letters by investigator discretion, for example, does that still count as a non-responder if they're not at 15 letter loss at the end of the study? And then my second question is, does this type of trial design extend to gene therapy as well, where they could get one dose of ILEA versus gene therapy? And does it extend to patients who are already getting more frequent treatments with a flibercept? Because then they would actually have to come off if they're randomized to the placebo arm. So your first comment asked about an IND that's under development, and I can't talk about INDs that are under development. We hold all of that confidential uh, to the extent they have made that public. I haven't seen it, so I. I'm not in a position to, to comment on, on, the, on anything that they've received or said. Um, sorry, I've now forgotten the second. You've got to give me one question at a time. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. So just generally, like, the idea of randomizing patients to one dose of a flibercept and seeing a decline compared to a TKI, does that also... Like, would you consider the same type of design for a gene therapy? And so you, patients are not treatment naive. Would they come off of treatment if they're randomized to the placebo arm in that setting? 
So one of the categories that I talked about as far as un in adequate and well-controlled trials, assuring that the patient has the disease that you're looking at. So that means they do have to, if they're, if they're treatment naive and you've diagnosed that, we know what that is. If they're being treated, we need to know that they still need continued therapy. So that does mean coming off therapy at least long enough to be able to tell that their retina is getting thicker again and that they're showing active disease or maybe they're, uh, we need to know that they're active patients. As far as reaching, giving a single injection um, versus either gene therapy single injection or intravitreal injection is perfectly acceptable. If the patients achieve a 15 letter loss, then we consider that to be an endpoint. Um, and treating them after that is um, common medical practice and we would evaluate where they are at the end, but they've already been a failure. Thank you. Everything. What if you what if you're rescued without a 15 letter loss? Okay, that's still um, that we do not consider to be a clinically relevant finding. So we would not consider we would continue to go. Well, in all cases, we want people to continue to be followed and see how they go and do. Um, but in general, we would not consider that patient to have met a failure criteria. We would just evaluate them with the rescue therapy and see where they are. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Great, uh, thank you so much. Uh, certainly, we would like to thank the uh, panelists here. Dr. Chamber, we truly appreciate your presence with us here. Uh, Leila, Christine, uh, Aaron, uh, Riyadh, and also David, uh, and so over there, Bob and uh, Phil. Thank you so much for joining us this panel. And at this time, we also would like to uh, finalize and, and uh, finish our program here for the Innovate Retina 2023. Certainly, this would not have been possible without the contribution from our outstanding faculty from around the globe here, and we see them here as well. Without you, we would not be able to have this program. And then in addition, we would like to again thanks, express our deepest gratitude to our sponsor. Certainly, you have seen where your contribution has helped us to put this evening program together, and we thank you sincerely with that. And with that, uh, we'd like to also learn from you how we can do things better, so you will be sent a uh, question to that, you can click on this and you can give us your input in there. And finally, uh, certainly we know that everybody's schedule is very busy, so we would like to now announce that our 2024 Innovate Retina will be on Thursday, October 17th uh, in Chicago, uh, where the next meeting of the American Academy will be. Uh, and now, um, in case if you have not had enough uh, roast beef or all of the sushi. <laughs> there are sushi and there are dessert outside that everyone can enjoy along with some type of alcoholic beverage that's available out there. Thank you and thank you again. Thank you. This is such a nice place. Thank you.